Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I'm with uh, an artist that I have followed for you know close to over 20 years, and um, I'll tell you why I like him so much. For me, and I think for everybody, relationships are all about energy exchange, right? Like a good relationship is when you're with somebody and you leave that conversation or that interaction and you have more energy than you came with, that they were kind enough to transfer some of that over to you. And my guest today has done that musically literally since the day I've heard him. I was in a record store. I want to say I was up in New York and it might have been like um, St. Mark's Records. Um, and in, that was around 97. And I heard this fucking sonic blast of just what I said, energy. And I was just in com completely blown away. And it was the album Aftertaste. And the song was Pure. And uh, it was Paige Hamilton singing on lead guitar. Paige is the founder and guitar player for the band Helmet. He's just the energy he puts forward on every single thing he does. And I've listened to every single thing he's put out is, I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, I don't know how he's still doing it after all these years. He's got a great voice. Lyrics are great. And he could tell he's just, this guy's given 110%. So I want to welcome Paige Hamilton to the show. I really appreciate it. If you've never heard of Paige or Helmet, let me tell you a little bit about him and the band. Uh, Paige is a composer, guitarist, producer, as I said, the founder and frontman of Helmet. They're a, uh, I hate to, what category? Do, I would always call you guys like hardcore, but that was a definition back in the 90s. You're not hardcore in today's definition. What, uh, so like, I've, I've never known what we're, you know, what to, what to call the band because we got to, you know, we, uh, you, you'd look in iTunes and it'd be like metal and then it'd be uh, alt in, metal. <laughs> but I heard, I heard one guy said industrial hardcore, another guy said post hardcore. Um, so yeah, it's best metal performance for in the meantime, that was the Grammy not nomination. <laughs> um, we went up against, I think like nine inch nails and I can't, I can't even remember. So I never, never really concerned myself with, 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 uh, you know, genres or titles or whatever. I just, you know, music as Duke Ellington said, two kinds of music, good and bad. Good and bad. Well, well you make only the good kind. Um, Paige's background in the mid eighties, he graduated from the university of Oregon. He relocated to New York to complete his master's in jazz guitar at the Manhattan school of music. He joined the noise rock band band of Susans when he was in the city. He recorded on their 19, 1989 album, love agenda. He also spent time in avant-garde composer, Glenn Branca's guitar orchestra recording on symphony six, which was Devil Choirs at the Gates of Heaven. And ultimately, he formed Helmet. He found some guys that liked the same kind of music, and they put the band together. Helmet's released eight albums, one greatest hits, and several EPs over the last 28 years, including 1992's Mean Time, which was certified gold and earned a Grammy, as Paige just referred to. The band's also contributed music to a number of films, including Johnny Mnemonic, the Crow, Feeling Minnesota, The Jerky Boys, Gun Crazy, and Judgment Night, which is a collaboration with the hip-hop group House of Pain. They continue recording and performing live all over the world. Their most recent album was Dead to the World, and that was released in 2016 by German-based label Ear Music. They're putting out a lot of good music. I've talked to a lot of people that have worked on Ear. Um, They're good folks. In addition to his work in Helmet, Page has done a significant amount of work as a guitarist. He played lead guitar for David Bowie. Yes, that David Bowie on the Hours Tour. He performed on Joe Henry's album, Trampoline. And he also uh, worked with Elliot Goldenthal on the film score for the film Heat, which was with Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. He also played on subsequent Goldenthal scores for the film SWAT, Titus, The Good Thief, 
Uh, he worked with Bono on that. Across the Universe and The Tempest, in addition to playing guitar on various scores, Page has composed original scores of his own, beginning with 1997's Chicago Cab and more recently for a series of independent action films. Uh, some of them are Skyhook, The Phoenix Rises, Convergence, and Sons of Liberty. Over the last several years, Page has also played guitar on the debut album by Lieutenant, which is a new project from Nate Mandel of Foo Fighters. And he also recorded with New York jazz and electronica band Malumbo for a soon-to-be-released album. He also appeared as a featured artist on Linkin Park's 2014 album, The Hunting Party. He played guitar and provided vocals on the song All for Nothing. In 05, Page produced Distort Yourself, which is a debut album from Gavin Rossdale of Bush, his sideband institute. And he also produced records for a number of other bands and is still producing records, including Bullets and Octane, Classic Case, and Rescue Rangers. Like I said, he's also performing live in orchestral settings. In 2015, he was invited by Elliot Goldenthal again to perform the score for the film The Tempest with Beethoven Academy Orchestra at the Film Music Festival in Krakow, Poland. Later that year, he performed at the 2015 Brit Festival near his hometown of Medford, Oregon. And as a soloist for uh, or on that on that show, he was a soloist for Mason Bates' Mothership and as a guitarist in the Brit Orchestra's All Bernstein program conducted by Teddy Abrams. Paige, I really appreciate your time. I've admired your music for ages, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Um, man, the first thing I have to ask you, because I've been thinking about this question for 20 years, is how the hell can you still sing the way you've been singing since the 90s? Like I said, your voice is not only a conduit for like energy, but you're screaming like you're still 25. And I like, it's almost like you got some anti-aging stuff going on here. Yeah, man. I, 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 I think one important thing is to not think about it too much and to not ever hold back. I, um, I met this guy, Mark Rank in, um, in Los Angeles probably when I uh, moved there about 2002, 2003, and I started working on size matters and Jay Baumgartner, uh, really wanted to work with, with me. And, um, so he don't, you know, donated studio time. So my friend John Tepesta and I started recording and, um, he said, Hey, you know, have you ever thought of working with a vocal guy? And I was like, nah, it was kind of this thing like, yeah, I'm a you know trained guitarist. So, you know, so to speak, but I always thought vocals had to come from the heart, but I, I learned, I started working with Mark and I learned so much about, um, sometimes some things I did naturally that, that were the, uh, good habits and other things were bad habits. And, uh, once you kind of know, I warm up. Uh, before every show um and it's more to get after you've played 15 or 20 shows on a tour you're 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 warmed up but it's more to get the kind of in in the mental place and i've you've done shows when i've been sick and mark uh, stressed sing through it never hold back and um i think he's he filmed uh filmed a bit of me singing this um song die alone from the last album dead to the world and it's an incredibly intense vocal and i i just about split a nut sack and he said <laughs> he said i'm going to play this for younger singers that i work with that hold back and think you can use studio tricks to get this kind of intensity and i think it's just a matter of of not not overthinking and just doing it you know and i mean there is um wharton tears who did um strap it on in meantime with us uh, engineered and, and slash kind of co-produced he um, he said, I, you, I have the loudest, you know, the strongest diaphragm of any singer he ever worked with. So there's a lot of wind support in there, you know, and that's, and, uh, it's just kind of, you do, I had to sing over the top of one of the loudest drummers in the world, John Stanier, the guy just the monster and he hits, he beats the shit out of the drum. So, um, I just, you know, you, it, I built this, I built my you know, throat, my voice up that, that way. So gosh, it's amazing, man. I'm, I'm just shocked. Um, well, I was surprised when I learned that you moved to the city to get your master's in jazz simply because outside of a little bit of jazz on the Betty album from 94, I never really heard you play jazz. So I have several questions. Um, first of all, what made you pick New York and, and where, where were you living at that time? Um, I moved, I moved to New. I was, I'd always kind of dreamt of living in New York ever since we took a family trip there in the late seventies. And, um, I, I just was completely blown away. I was just Oregon hippie kid with the don't California Kate Oregon bumper sticker on my <laughs> book wagon. And, uh, and I was like, I don't need to go anywhere else. I love Oregon. And I guess got to New York and it just it felt like this foreign, amazing, incredible place. The energy was yeah. just, in, um, and I'd sort of made up my mind that I was going to live there one day. And I, uh, 
was talking to my friend Barry Lehman, a drummer that I was at Oregon with, and he said, what if you went to school and at a smaller conservatory like Manhattan School of Music? I'd never heard of it. Back then, we had no internet. I looked it up in the library, applied and flew out for the audition, and once I got accepted, it was it. And my, my family was a little distraught because I was 3,000 miles from the comfort, you know, uh, comforts of home, but I uh, ended up moving into a, a single-room occupancy welfare hotel when I was 25, and then it took me two years to get my master's degree. Um, and, uh, I lived there for a couple of years and then moved literally further uptown into, uh, it was Dominican Harlem at the height of the crack epidemic. Oh, up um, in the one sixties and Riverside around there. Yeah. I was yeah. on 141st between Broadway and Riverside. And, uh, we, um, <laughs> I had two, two SWAT, SWAT crack raids in the summer of 88. I was there for one of them and I saw, I mean, I actually looked at, looked it up recently um, cause somebody was asking me about it and they, they had, there were helicopters and, you know, flak jackets and the whole, our entire block was blocked off. Turned out one of the biggest crack houses. Well, the biggest crack house in Manhattan was across the street from us. So that's why we heard gunshots all the time. And for a kid from Oregon, from small town, Oregon, it was a, it was a, you know, a bit of a shock, but, um, I, I, I feel like the, the, also the influence of living in the hotel where I'm hearing six, seven, eight languages every day and, um, you know, smelling the food from, you know, that my neighbors down the hall from, you know, that spoke Patua from Haiti were cooking or the Indian guys inviting me over for, you know, for, uh, for a doll and, and, you know, goat or whatever they were, they were cooking that night. And I, it really ha- had an impact on me and I was hearing all this amazing music and, um, uh, just being a you know a member of the human race, and I think like it was a, it was an eye opening um, experience, and and um, yeah, it definitely influenced in, influenced who, you know, who I am as a man as an artist. That's really cool. Yeah, I, that's one of the gr- you know I grew up there, so it's one of the greatest gifts that I feel I got from is the ability to like get along with everybody, and there's no you know it's just very normal. Yeah, I'm, I'm, after the riots in LA, I, uh, I the building I, I used to live in, we had uh, a, you know a, I had a black Vietnam vet next door to me. I had a Hispanic couple um, upstairs and a Polish, an older Polish woman next door to me. So we we just were all on our roof and and had uh, had beers and hung out and and I said, well, if I hate you because of your race or your religion or whatever, you know, I'm going to burn down your place. My place is going down with it. So just we just there was never. There was never a, I remember them closing down Times Square that day. I was up at the guitar shops on 48th Street and everything was closing down because they were just bracing for riots to hit New York. And it, and it, you know, I'm not saying we didn't have problems in New York and there's, you know, racial tension, but it's, I feel like there is, um, for me, having uh, uh, grown up in a small town with one black family, Billy Inge played on my baseball team and I just never <laughs> saw a reason to, to dislike someone for, you know, who they were. I mean, and, and, and New York was great for me in that way. You know, I was friends with the, there were kids that lived across the hall from me in the, uh, when I moved uptown and I played ball with them in the hallways and I had a Marshall stack in my room and they're like, Oh, Paige, your music sounds so beautiful. And I'm like, really? I'm writing, <laughs> I'm writing born annoying and, uh, you know, <laughs> gay you to go these ridiculously aggressive riffs. And they were just, it was sweet and kind. And so I never, yeah, I never saw the need to, to, uh, you know, as I say, dislike someone for, for who they were. Yeah, man. Where, where'd your interest in jazz start and how did this switch over to sort of the more aggressive music that you're known for? The, my, I was talking about this with someone yesterday, the music that our parents listened to, they would listen to everything from Puff the Magic Dragon, the Brothers Four to, uh, George Shearing and Ella Fitzgerald. And it somehow s- seeped in. They also loved Dixieland music. And so I remember that music when it was a party and there was always this incredibly positive vibe. Mom and dad had the, the you know, the, the bowls of peanuts and, and, uh, and bugles out and they were put on this Beautiful. jazz music where, you know, starting to pound their cocktails. And it was like, this is a great, this is a happy thing. This is a happy music. And so then I, um, started playing guitar at 17 and it was a uh, because of led zeppelin and i uh, then i heard george benson you know his, his pop album uh Breezen, and i had never heard anyone play the guitar like that and it just blew my mind and so i started to explore that and uh, by the time i got to the university of oregon and decided that spring semester of my freshman year on academic probation as a pre-med major that i would 
study guitar and and I had the greatest teacher you could ever uh, imagine this guy Gary Hagberg who's a professor of philosophy at Bard College now um, and he said uh, I said I want to be a, a music major I want to be a musician he said if you want to do it bad enough you can do it and I knew I did so um, he you know started to, he taught me an A minor seven flat five chord and we kind of kind of went from there and I just became obsessed with it you know discovered Miles Davis and through the album Kind of Blue you've got John Coltrane Bill Evans Cannibal Outerly Wynton Kelly Joe, Philly Joe Jones Paul Chambers like this incredible core of musicians that that made that album uh, and so I would buy Bill Evans records and uh you know, Cannibal records and 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 specifically John Coltrane records and when you talk about aggression or passion as I always saw it I always felt like Coltrane would never would never play in a room and be ignored and I thought you know what he plays every solo every note as if it's his last and that just that changed my life and I would listen to Coltrane daily um the album I love supreme completely turned me turned me upside down and just like it it I wasn't understanding technically what he was doing at the time but I, the, the energy and the passion and the intensity was was it was universal, and I felt like this guy was his his voice was his saxophone. I could identify his his horn in any context, whether he was playing with Miles or um, playing with Monk or doing his, one of his own things. And this this to me was it, it, uh, you know twofold: the energy and intensity, and also developing your own voice. And to me, I love. Jimi Hendrix and I love Led Zeppelin and ACDC and Black Sabbath, but I I wanted my own sound, my own thing. And Cole, you know, jazz guys have that. You know, even drummers like Art Blakey, um, Elvin Jones, you can hear them and know it's them. And so it was really important to me to. And I, I don't know how I specifically developed my own sound, but it's sort of it happened. You know, over the course of time, I think by by digging into this music and as my another great mentor John Stoll, the great jazz guitarist, said. He said, actively listen when you listen. So when you're listening to music, you're not just putting it on in the background, doing dishes or whatever. You listen, you're closing your eyes and you're going inside the music. Maybe you're focusing on the, you know, the bass line or maybe you're focusing on the chord changes or the melody or the, or the, you know, rhythmic things, how jazz players cross the bar lines. And I think it sort of helped me develop this different way of hearing chords and rhythm and, um, and helmet swings. As, as you know, it has uh-huh. that. You know, it's a, it's it's about it's about uh, the feel. The great producer slash guitarist Danny Korchmar said, "You guys are the this heavy band that grooves." And he brought uh, Steve Jordan to see Helmet shows, and they were like, "Man, I love this." You know, and uh, guys like T.M. Stevens, who I looked up to, they were like, "You know, you guys just you sound like no other heavy band." And it was really flattering that these amazing musicians were getting into our music. And I think the feel, the swing, that that had a lot to do with it. And I, I think that comes from my love of jazz. And I never tried to specifically incorporate um, jazz into Helmet, but I think it had a huge impact on who I am as a guitarist. You know, I just want to point something out. You you made a comment that is incredibly important. You said, I wanted to, pre- you know, you, you were talking about, uh, I think Coltrane said he played every note like it was his last and I wanted to do the same thing. Mm. And it, I, the point I want to make to the listeners is because it's all, you know, guitar players and musicians. This is a delib- you know, I opened up with this with what turned me on about you was the energy. That's not like random, like, oh, this is a deliberate thing on your part. And, you know, um, I'm not surprised because you can't you can't put out like that you know, oh, you know, randomly, you can't just like fall off a log and say, oh, I'm going to like blast the shit out of, I'm going to, you know, give all this energy, you know, it, you, this is a deliberate thing. And, you know, I think that accounts for a lot of your success, man. Reminds me of, uh, of a couple of things, doing an interview in 92 when the band was starting to explode and meantime came out and we, there was the melody maker in the enemy and I forget which one it was, but the guy saying, yeah, there's no way you can maintain this level of intensity for your whole life because as you get older, you're, no. you know, your, your libido slows down. Everything slows down. Here I am at 58 and I, yeah. I, I have more of a sense of urgency than I ever did. And I always say, I say I was what I would have been classified as a hyperactive kid. They would have given me Ritalin and tried to tried to mellow this this energy. I was the you know kid getting into trouble of the of the three of us, my, my brother and sister. My brother was this amazing student and studied on weekends and I was 
sneaking the car out in the middle of the night and just <laughs> I all felt like I had this so ADD or ADHD or whatever they would call it now and I think you you know that's that a lot of creative energy comes from that you know and um you know it can be incredibly annoying i'm sure you know my my parents may they rest in peace they put up with a lot of shit and and it was <laughs> difficult for them at times but but it's it's you know i feel i still feel um, that I'm performing at a high level, and the I every time I get on stage, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be there. I'm comfortable. It's my little world. Plugging into that amp and having that microphone in front of me, and I just I love it. We just finished uh, uh, about 20 shows in Europe, and you know festivals and headline dates, and I, I felt the last show in the Czech Republic. I you know I feel it felt as, as strong as I did you know in 1989 when we played at Louderbacks in Brooklyn. You know? <laughs> That's really cool. No, I feel the same way. I'm a couple of years behind you. I'm 54 and I feel great. I don't see any slowdown and and I better not see any. I mean, I'm going out of my way to make sure I don't have to, you know, because I like I like that. I like giving off energy. I like, you know, it's a it's a I don't want to say empowering, but it just, you know, I like producing at 110% whatever I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, music is. I, I discovered music um, as this form of expression that it's, that's universal. You could, you don't have to speak a common um, language. You know, I mean, English, German, whatever. Um, you know, you. It's everyone understands music. I went to see um, because of, because of John Coltrane, and the last concert he did was at the. Um, I think at when I say it was the African Cultural Center in Manhattan, and it was uh, Baba Ola Tunji. Um, the African drums of passion. And I, of course, went out and got a cassette tape because Coltrane loved it and listened to it. And I also went and got the Slaminski's thesaurus of scales and patterns. <laughs> or, well, Coltrane did this and Coltrane did that. And uh, But I actually went to in Seattle. I moved to Seattle excuse me, Seattle for a hot minute before I moved to New York because I, I had auditioned at the Cornish Institute. And they said, well, you already have a degree. We can give you another bachelor's degree. And they, they admitted me. And I decided, you know, I'm just going to make the leap and move to New York. And uh, But uh, I saw some great concerts while I was in Seattle. And at this Chinese restaurant upstairs in downtown Seattle, they had live concerts. And I went to see Baba Ola Twinji, The Drums of Passion. And I danced for That's two wild. Solid, solid hours with – he had just dancers and drums and vocals. That was it. And it was the most amazing, one of the most amazing concerts I've ever been part of. I was, I was, you know, two feet off the ground for two solid hours with this room full of people. And it's, it just speaks to the, the, the power of music. And that's, I'm still fascinated by it. I still, it gets, gets me through hard times. It gets me, you know, emotional uh, things that you go through and there, there might be a piece by, Ray Fawn Williams, The Lark Ascending, or there might be a, you know, or it might be Highway to Hell, you know, from ACDC, and, and, or it might be, uh, you know, Interstellar Space from Coltrane, or it might be Bill Evans at the Vanguard, you know, these, there's just, it, to me, they're, they're, I never, I never get tired. I hear something new. I've listened to the Bill Evans records, I don't even know, hundreds of times, and I still hear something new every time, you know, and I've figured out licks, and I've figured out a, chord change here or there and and i transcribed bill evans solos or coltrane or miles or west montgomery or clifford brown and um you learn it's just it just it's just amazing to get inside another musician's head and feel try to imagine how they arrived at this you know and, and it's that's I, I recommend studying music to anyone i remember guys saying back then well i don't want to know too much because then i'll lose my i'll lose the heart and feel and soul and i'm like that's that's your problem that's ignorance learn. man like, yeah i want to learn sounds, and know as much as i yeah. can school's and, never out for the pro man yeah yeah and it doesn't mean that you're gonna st suddenly only sound like this guy or girl or whatever you're gonna sound like yourself if you set out to, to do that i mean hagberg um who my, my my mentor gary hagberg worked with howard the great howard roberts and oh, he yeah. started guitar institute of technology which is now musicians institute and actually uh, kind of came full circle about five years ago and I spoke at their graduation, which was such an honor. Very cool. And Hagberg and Howard had these books called the guitar compendium. And I'm actually part, what, what I'm going to do now that my mother's passed away and I have a, a, these projects that I'd want, wanted to do for years. One of them is to go through Howard's super chops program of over 20, you know, uninterrupted over 20 weeks. And, um, he, you know, you learn the, the, you learn the elements of music, you know, you like your chord scales, arpeggios, um, you know, music is, you know, obviously you know, melody, harmony, rhythm, form, and then in the case of lyrical music text and, and you learn the, you, um, 
you get the you know the the the, the tools and then express yourself as well as transcribing solos or learning a lick or imitating your heroes and it's, it's all these things uh, help you develop your own style and sound and become your own musician and i think there's no you can't under i i personally just i would never underestimate the the impact that uh, um, howard or gary um, have had on me and to, to encourage me to learn, you know, and sometimes you can get lazy because you're like, well, I can get the sheet music to this and learn this standard this way when you should learn by ear as, and use sheet music. So, um, so, yeah. Man, I just think it's cool that you've been playing guitar for 41 years and you're as enthusiastic as you were 41 years ago, probably when you picked up a guitar. That's really, that is a testament to the power of music, man, and, and guitar Absolutely. and what you're doing. Did you yeah. always want to front your own band versus being a sideman or some other kind of support? And if so, why? I never thought about it. I never, I never had a plan from day one. Actually, um, when I, when I started to kind of think about what I wanted to do with my life and I was maybe 18 or 19 years old, laying in the middle, middle of Hayward field at the university of Oregon, I was, I would go jump over the fence at night and lie there and think, what, what am I going to do? I want to be a musician. How am I going to go about this? And I didn't think, specifically i want to be jimmy page but i wanted to be jimmy page well then i wanted to be george benson then i wanted to be pat Matheny. then i wanted to be john colton <laughs> then i wanted to be charlie parker then i wanted to be Thelonious monk and i i never thought well, am i going to lead a band but i was in a, a great band called band of susans as you mentioned and i got to play with glenn branca and reese chatham who's a great composer in new york um and I was learning from all these different people, but nobody was doing specifically what I wanted to hear. I go, I love heavy music and I love aggressive music and I love uh, rhythmic, you know, r in rhythmically interesting things. And I was it was always drumming on my legs on the subway playing three against four. And um, so I just I just decided I have to form my own band. And I started writing songs. And Robert Poss from Band of Susans was a big influence on me. He said, well, I have a four track recorder and a drum machine and this little microphone and I mic my guitar and I write that's how I write and I was like wow that's fast so I, I can do it all by myself I could I play this drum machine part and then this and um so I started writing and that it, it's where I started to develop as a producer um and start think seeing the whole picture rather than just a, a part and so you start thinking in terms of three minute rock songs and I loved, I was really shy at first. Then I saw, I remember seeing, I've talked to Henry Rollins about this, how we, Band of Susans played with Rollins. And I go like, you wouldn't say Rollins is, is uh, Celine Dion. He's not a great quote unquote singer, but he's a great front man. He's a great yeah. vocal. Go, I like that. That guy gives it everything every time he's out there. And I, I love that, you know, and that was that, you know, we played with um, them and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds in London. Wow. Rollins Cave and the Bad Seeds. And there's, these what are a, two. What a show, were, man. They, oh my God. It was mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, it was mind blowing. And I was like, these are two seminal bands. And I was just soaking up every minute of it. And then we played uh, in Australia with Sonic Youth and I'd sit on my, my ass on the side of stage and watch them every night. And, um, and I got to see so many amazing, you know, people perform from Sonny Rollins three times to, to Dizzy Gillespie a couple of times, Art Blakey I saw six times. I, um, I saw Merle Haggard. I saw Willie Nelson three times. I saw Waylon Jennings. I've seen so many uh, Pat Metheny three times. I've seen these phenomenal. I mean, the LA Philharmonic, the greatest concert I've ever seen in my life was a few months ago. I saw them do Beethoven's Ninth with uh, Dudamel. And I just went to Beethoven's house in Baden where he wrote that piece. And um, and my mother's service, the final piece we sang was Ode to Joy, um, which is uh, the, the the lyrics to, you know, the, the Ninth Symphony, the choral part. Um, and this this all these things end up sort of influencing, influencing, you know, one as a as a musician. And um, I just I knew there was no way I was going to fully be able to express everything I wanted to express as a musician if I was you know, as just playing other people's music. So writing, writing to me became, that's how I, I, I sort of developed. And I knew I, I was writing at a higher level than I was performing at early on. I'm, my big band chart um, at grad school that you had to write for your master's degree was, I remember guys saying, I wanted to use these weird chords that I was learning from, um, you know, John Stoll slash Jim Hall, like a triad with a flat two in the bass. 
functions as a dominant chord and you can move these in minor thirds just like a diminished chord etc cetera, etc cetera. and i was applying all these things that were that were advanced but i still wanted it to swing and feel good and this there was a trombone player in my class at uh, manhattan school of music his name was actually glenn miller and he <laughs> he came out he was a really great player and he came up to me and said man your piece swings and i'm like that means so much to me he goes it felt really fun to play but the teacher grabbed the chart off the uh, music stand in from in front of me because you conduct your own piece he said that last chord he's like what this is root position and i go yeah he goes no a, a major seven sharp five chord is not a not a super common <clears throat> jazz chord it's you know a sharp nine flat nine you know uh, 13 flat nine these are all common chords in jazz but a major seven sharp five and i loved it because ralph towner used it and i transcribed some ralph towner stuff and so there i was i was you know, half being a smart ass and half just trying different stuff yeah. out and, compo- you know, composing at a higher level than I was playing at. And so the playing eventually kind of caught up and, um, you know, and was certainly in the context of helmet and I would never call myself a great jazz player. I do. It's a labor of love. And I, I, you know, maybe I know 150 standards or whatever. And I love doing that music, but you know, guys that dedicate their life to it are the real deal. Like, you know, John Stowell or, um, you know, I mean, my heroes who I've seen, I, uh, you know, Jim, Jim Hall, may he rest in peace. And I feel lucky that I've been able to see so many of them. So let me ask you this. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to people that play in the style that you play and write in the style of that you write and for lack of a better term, let's call it aggressive. Okay. Because it's not passive. So let's just call it aggressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with the fire that you have burning inside of you, because that does, that's where that comes from. This isn't like a, you know, there's something lit inside of you that you're, you're, you know, that's getting fueled every time you communicate like that. Where does that come from? Like almost, I don't want to say like, what are you working out? Because it, that's too, too, uh, what's lighting, what's the ignition for that fire? If that, if that's a question even. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I'm not not sure. I mean, I I know I know that I still, as you say, I, I I'm still as excited about the guitar as I was when I started. More so, actually, because once you work and you get to a level that you you're um, at times you're you, you can play with you know without thinking. You're you're unconscious almost, and you're in this you're in this place. And I love playing the helmet music because if I know my band knows 85 tunes, and we will play in the course of a night anywhere from 25 to 30 tunes um you're you just kind of get lost in the in, in the music and i'm not thinking about it and so you're you're freeing yourself up so that as i i have these tight arrangements and and you know these unison guitars and all this stuff and then i get to just kind of splatter you know paint uh jackson pollock style over the top of the and, and make a big mess or as uh, Hagrid <laughs> just like ornette coleman you know putting on a lab coat and and going like let me see what happens you know and, and i'm you have to be not afraid to do that. And I think bands, friends of mine that are rock stars and millionaires and sick of sick of their lives, they're playing these, you know, there's either a slave to the computer on stage and you're, they're playing the same set list every single night and they're going through the motions because they're making a, a handsome living at it. And I knock on wood, I make a, I eke out a living and I feel really fortunate to do what I love to make a living. And um, I go into every project uh, you know, trying to fi- uh, find what's good and interesting. You know, when I got the Rescue Rangers, he came to, to my jazz gig at Santa Monica Airport, Pascal, the singer, and they were kind of a stoner rock band. Well, I, I, he started writing these songs and there were, it was a bit of a mess. And I said, but I heard something in there. And I said, OK, you love the Foo Fighters and Queens of the Stone Age. Why don't you stop listening to them? I'm going to turn you on to, you know, James Brown and Marvin Gaye. And, you know, let's and you know, he loved the Beatles as well. But um, I think like keeping it, you know, keeping it fresh for yourself, never, um, never just going through the motions. And I've never gotten on stage and felt like, oh, we got to play this show. And I've been exhausted. I mean, we started this Europe tour with 11 in a row. Air conditioning broke on the bus day one. And we um, it was 100 degrees, you know, in, in Munster, mm-hmm. you know, at the Trevor Festival and 
Um, but you, but I love <laughs> playing music. And so I come up with a set list that I'm excited about every night and they're going to be some staples that we play a lot of stuff from dead to the world. And there are certain songs that they flow into other songs, but I think just never allowing yourself to kind of go on autopilot. And I, and I won't name any of my friends, but I, I obviously am friends with many people and bands that are, that have sold millions and millions of records and they seem uh, un, unhappy, you know, doing what they're doing. And I, I think p- part of that being a fan of jazz and, and, and playing jazz every single day when I wake up, it's usually what I do. I work on a jazz standard. It might be darn that dream or, or uh, angel eyes. I don't know. And you jazz, it's like these chord changes look like this, but what, you know, you can do something different with it every day. Cause I know the elements that, you know, that comprise, you know, a song, as I mentioned, it's melody, harmony, rhythm, form, text. These, this is, it's all, that's what music is. And so it's, and, and you approach a tune as a jazz, with a jazz frame of mind, you, you can play it differently every day. And, um, and we, we, we all have little bags of tricks. You know, I have this cool lick that Jack Wilkins taught me 30 years ago and I <laughs> still use it, but then you develop that as a theme and, and rather than just seeing things as this song has to be played exactly like this every single time, you know, and helmet music is, um, it's, it's kind of modal music. It's basically miles, uh, you know, kind of blue or Coltrane impressions. It's these melodic lines that are there, you know, in, in drop tuning played, you know, in unison as a power chords. And then I started to develop these, uh, these extensions and alterations that I play on the chords just by, doing it so much and going, wow, that sounds great. If I play these open strings, oh, that's an F major seven sharp 11 chord with no third, you know, I mean, I can analyze it. But I'm just going, this sounds cool. Right. You know? And I think just never, you know, pa- painting yourself into a corner and, and feeling like I'm, you know, I'm just going to play the same set every night, the same songs, the same way, you know, and, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe that's how you keep it fresh. I don't know. I think, um, I have this expression and it's kind of true. I think how you do one thing is how you do everything, you know? Mm. And, um, that I think this probably just speaks to your authentic, your uh, authenticity is a canned word, but like your integrity as a, a person of, of, you know, not, you know, just being genuine about things. And I think that's, that's, you know, I mean, mean, I'm, Sonny Rollins talked about this in Coltrane too, about going back. Like you, you discover Sonny Rollins and, and he, uh, he's listening to Louis Armstrong. And so you go, I better check out Louis Armstrong. If Sonny Rollins loves him, he must be amazing. And I, as a, as a musician, I'm, you know, I, I love, I'm fascinated by artists. And, um, when I was doing the Glenn Branca symphony six and symphony eight at the world's fair in Seville and uh, Sevilla, Spain in um, 92, at the, I had to do a press tour for meantime. So I was flying to, you know, London, Paris, Amsterdam, spending a day in a hotel room, chain smoking and doing interviews. And I, (laughs) you know, at the end of this, I'm going to treat myself to three days in Madrid and I'm going to go to the Prado museum because I love these Spanish painters, Goya and Velasquez. And, um, I discovered Ribera at that, at that time. And, um, you, and I, I, this last trip before the tour started, I went to Cezanne's uh, workshop in Aix-en-Provence. I went to, I, w- I, I sat with yeah, in front of Johann Sebastian's bo- box grave at Thomas Kirche in Leipzig. And I went to, uh, Bella Bartok's grave in, in Budapest. His house was closed. So I'm going back in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, it, to me, it's fascinating. I mean, I've been to Beethoven's apartment in Heiligenstadt and his, um, and I, the Pasqual, Pasqualiti house, I've been in Mozart's apartment three times. To stand in the room, stand in the spot. I stood in the spot where Van Gogh stood and painted the Café in Arles in uh, South France. I went to, uh, I, I stood in front of Van Gogh's apartment. To me, there's something, this connection that we have as artists to, to, to the past, to history. And we're part of this tradition, I mean, creative thought, whether it was being 17 reading catcher in the rye and relating to <laughs> you know relating to that or lord of the flies or whatever and then you go you know, i mean then to you know later reading cormac mccarthy and you know graham green or whatever it is i i think just being passionate about it and being fascinated by I, to me it, i i am and i'm passionate about it and i feel i get goosebumps i mean standing in beethoven's you know room he slept here every summer for four years and you're just like 
God, this piano that says do not touch. And of course, I <laughs> underneath the rope and just touched it. I just want to touch this piano he played. And I don't know, this transfer of energy and this, you know, continuing in a you know, tradition of respecting your, you know, artists on that that are on that level, you know, greater than I will ever, ever, ever uh, be, you know, and, and I, I think it still fascinates me. You know, I'm still excited, still excited by it. Are you good about, like you said, you did these uh, press tours and it was pretty intense and it was, I guess, didn't sound like it was really exciting, which I totally get. Um, and then you went to treat yourself. Are you good about that? That's, that's a smart thing to do. I've been over the last 10 years or so. I go to Europe. <clears throat> I try to go to Europe a week ahead and stay maybe a week after. And I just spend time by myself. I have my guitar um, and, uh, you know, a flight case with my guitar and a suitcase and a hmm. backpack. I'll hop on a train, the TGV train from Paris to Marseille. And, um, or I went, I took the train from Vienna to Prague and, and, uh, um, you know, flew from Marseille to Vienna and just go, I did try to make a point. I, uh, I specifically wanted to go to Vienna this time and spend a couple of days in Prague. Cause we, we keep gear in Prague for, for our, that's where our Europe company is, um, nomads of Prague. And so I had to do some programming and I wanted to, you know, plug my rig in over there and, you know, dust it off a little bit. And, and, uh, I try to do that. I, I feel like it's, um, you might spend an extra couple of thousand dollars on hotels and flights or whatever it is, but it's, it's, you're there and it's the most, uh, it's, it couldn't be more convenient. I'm already going to be there. Like why not, you know, hop a thousand miles down the road and go see Beethoven's house in Baden. And, I, and I've, after touring for 30 years or whatever it's been, I have friends all over the world that are amazing and that pick, I'll pick you up at the airport and we'll go to dinner and we'll do this. And um, I had actually started working with Thomas Lang, the great um, Austrian drummer from Vienna. And he's the one that told me about Beethoven's house in Baden. I didn't even know about it. And um, he hooked me up with a, a dear friend of his who came and took uh, my friend, my, my Viennese friend uh, Regina and I to this amazing uh, uh, dinner and, and um, I'm going to return the favor. I said, please come to Los Angeles and we'll go out. And, and I, um, I, I, I don't know. I've just, I, I make a point of, you know, of, of trying to, to do that kind of thing. And what I'm, I walk around, like I say, for an afternoon, um, you know, where, where if I have three hours in, in the case of, of in uh, box grave in Leipzig, I'd never done it. I looked and it was a two and a half mile walk. Um, so I just got up that morning and, you know, once I got into the club to kind of freshen up a little bit, I just, I just took off and, um, and it was earth shattering by JS Bach. I mean, maybe the greatest of all geniuses like is buried right here. It's just, it blows my mind, you know, and yeah. this is the, he was the Kapellmeister in and played that organ. And, uh, to me, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, I just think, I think it's good that you take, I, I always struggle with balance as far as like, putting the brakes on and, and stopping work. And I think I just admire that you're able to do that. It's yeah. good. I think it's much healthier to be honest with you. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's easy to get lazy and there are plenty of days when I am lazy. I mean, I remember waking up in Poland one day at five in the afternoon from jet lag and I was like, sound check was already underway. And I just, I was just exhausted because I get jet lag and I'll wake up. I could fall asleep at two in the morning and then wake up at three in the morning and, uh, but when you have the energy, if you try to get, make yourself get up, set your alarm and, and get up and, um, you can see, you can experience a lot and it makes that trip all, all the more amazing, you know? And I think it makes for, for me for better shows. Cause I feel like, wow, I'm inspired. I mean, I know people in Kansas city are probably sick of me talking about Charlie Parker, but I have a very, very dear friend who's taken me to his grave site. And I sat on his tomb on his grave and I, and it went next to his mother and I, um, I went to the jazz museum in Kansas city and happened to walk in on the day they were reinstalling the plastic saxophone that he played at Massey hall. Um, it had been uh, being refurbished because ants had gotten into the display and I happened to walk in on the very day that it was sitting there in the case. And the guy let me touch the horn and the, hold the case ah. that the bird's hand was on. And I helped him put the plexiglass back up and, and reinstall the horn. And it just was like, I mean, that's some kind of higher power at work. Yeah, you know, I agree. It's amazing that this great hero, actually speaking of that friend, she just texted me right now. Asked that's, me how I am. That's so, that's, wow. The universe, wow. the universe at work. That's crazy right now. How are you? I'm like, Hey, yeah, I'm just talking about you. Thank you for taking me to the bird's grave. So, yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, let's take a step back. So your first album, Strap It On, great title, by the way, comes out in 1990, gets great reviews. 92, Meantime comes out and goes gold and has sold over 2 million copies. How, at that time, how did that change things for you as far as like confidence, money, the music business, and maybe even musically? And you were still pretty young when this happened. Did you have all the coping skills that you needed to handle like these sudden changes in demand that were on you? Mm, not necessarily. I was in a relationship at the time and I split the relationship up. Um, she kicked me out actually because I was behaving like an idiot. And um, I, I did the kind of classic stupid stuff that you do when you make a million dollars. And I was running around New York like an idiot, and, um, you know, loved, loved it. And um, was just partying and just, just being, a, 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 you know, an, an idiot, like I said. And I moved, moved into my own apartment. I started to write the Betty album and I started to think, uh, I remember doing a couple of interviews and one was, uh, that I felt like was a little condescending uh, for spin magazine. And he'd say, you know, I had a, I had the gold record in the meantime, sit, sitting on the f floor, I think next to the front door. And he made a comment about that in the article and something about, I just feel like it was when you have success, people are ready to knock you down and um, they don't, you know, they're going to assume that you're disingenuous and that your whole goal in life was to be a rock, a rich rock star. And I, and I, I, you know, much like Ray Davies of the Kinks or Paul Westerberg would love had a, a penchant for shooting myself in the foot. I'm like, oh, you like that? Well, this next album's going to have a woman on the cover with a basket of flowers, and I'm going to do this jazz t um, uh, tune, and we're going to do this <laughs> funk funk song that Henry wrote. And uh, and uh, I was basically, you know, in a say like, you know, screw you, like we're, you know, we're not a mainstream rock band. We are, you know, we're, we're doing music that we love and believe in. And, and, um, and I'm glad we did because Betty turned out to be, a, 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 you know, the Betty tour that we did the 20th anniversary was a bigger tour than the meantime tour. People. Have Wonderful been, record. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. It was my favorite helmet record. Yeah. People, uh, people appreciated it, but a lot of people, we didn't, it didn't sell as many out of the box because people like, you know, the 14 year old kid. And I'll tell this story. Uh, my, my, my friend, Dave Berger, who was one of the, uh, the top two uh, uh, authorities on Duke Ellington in the world. He was one of my classmates at Manhattan school of music. He's transcribed like hundreds of, uh, there's the hundreds of Duke Ellington charts. And he said, Paige, I'd love to bring my son by the studio. He just thinks I'm a, a, a nudge and total idiot. Doesn't respect me. And, uh, but he loves helmet. He loves, you know, meantime, <laughs> so we were, we were working on aftertaste at RPM studios in, in New York. The second, the last three songs we did, we did that album at Capitol in LA and that also in New York. And, um, I just was praising his dad, man, your dad's one of my heroes. He's one of the great musicians in the world. He's running jazz at Lincoln center with Wynton Marsalis and he's just phenomenal. And the kid's like, yeah, I, I didn't really like the last album. Why do you have a woman on the cover? He was a 14 year old kid. And so those kids that wanted this muscular, this yeah. industrial kind of thing that we had on the cover of meantime, they want a package. They want you to do the same thing. And as a, for me as an artist, uh, you know, I'm constantly trying to push forward and do something different. Well, if you like that, I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn. And I guess it means I am responding to the world around me. And I always like, I always take pride in that, in, 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 in kind of ignoring that stuff to a certain extent, but there has to be a little bit of that rebellious nature, I think, in, in, in you as a musician to, you want to challenge people and, that 14 year old kid might be the kid that at 24 loves Betty's his favorite album. I've had right. people say that to me. I didn't like aftertaste when it first came out. I just expected this. And I'm like, well, of course, if the band, if a band has a history, everybody has expectations. I, the first killing joke album is still my favorite, you know, but they keep making great albums and they're all great albums. And in my opinion, and, um, it's just that that first album was my experience of going like, wow, discovering this band for the first time and having my mind blown. So it's always going to have this place near and dear to me, but I also love fire dances and all the, you know, um, I'll listen to, you know, to, to, uh, you know, the, the last album they put out our money is not our God. These are great songs, great albums. And I, and I, um, I think with helmet, it's the same thing. Somebody's gonna be like meantime was the album. Or something. I remember one guy, um, Kirk from Flipside magazines, like, Oh, I went to see helmet and, um, you know, he, he loves strap it on and born annoying and all that stuff. He said, I wanted helmet and I got a bonnet because we'd softened up so much with meantime. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, so everybody's going to have an opinion about what you're doing. If they're a fan. 
And you can't make everybody. Ha- it's like being in a. You can't. I've, I've been with my wife twenty six years, but we have a great relationship. I don't make her fucking happy every day. I mean, it's just not. It's statistically Absolutely. impossible. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and even so- more so when you got fans that you know when it comes down, to, they don't know you. They have this imaginary relationship with you. You know, yeah, and they have these expectations of you, which is like even really nuttier. Um, you, well, you get treated like it's you're not even a, a human being anymore. And it's funny. I went out for dinner with some, uh, my, my, my buddy and his sister and some friends of theirs about four or five years ago. <laughs> and the guy was a jewelry designer, really nice. He and his wife and they said, we're going to take us out for dinner. And, and uh, he we, I got introduced. He said, oh, this is Paige Hamilton. He said, are you Paige Hamilton, Paige Hamilton? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you got old. Oh my like, God. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> because I, the I, clock has fucking stopped for him, obviously. Right. <laughs> is it, you know, he probably hadn't seen a video since 95 oh or six God. or whatever. And I just, I just, you know, I'm wearing glasses and I have gray hair and a big ball patch. And I started cracking up. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that happens in life. You know, <laughs> You're, but you, he didn't wasn't even thinking oh this is a human being i might hurt his feelings by saying that he didn't because oh i you know yeah but it was it's hilarious you know and i think you people just of course they have expectations because they know you through your music i feel like i know john coltrane through his music right. but i would sit and have coffee with him and he would be really cool i don't know maybe he would maybe he wouldn't but right, right. Um, it, you know. i can't believe that's really funny that's uh, I know. well i mean not it's funny but it's really like kind of pathetic to be honest with you I mean, yeah it's, I, it's I just some, it, I yeah i mean tell the story you know obviously i'm not hurt and i'm like i'm like hey it's been a, you know it's been a good life and i'm i feel like that's it's funny and i love that he had that relationship with with me and with helmet and then you know his image <laughs> i was like to me elvis costello is always going to look like that guy on the cover of uh this year's model yeah you know, right like, right like brawny giant glasses and, and which he kind of does but you know like he's you know we all get older and it's you know it's 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 funny i mean except for david bowie he seemed to never age that guy I don't yeah know he did a good job he had something going on yeah so. for the record uh page looks great i was just talking to him beforehand how he's in great shape so <laughs> for whatever that's worth um wow hey i want to ask you about uh you, you talked about betty two of my favorite helmet songs are on that record and i just want to ask you about them Biscuits for Smut, the bass line in there is like, it's throbbing and that's, you know, I, my notes are amazing groove. You talked about groove. What's the backstory to that song? It's just, I've, I've listened to that dozens of couple, times. Yeah, a couple of things going on. There's no bass on the song. That's just, uh, that's the, uh, my, my beautiful, which I stupidly sold, my blue uh, GNL SC2. Um, and I found it at, at, uh, at, um, Alex music in New York, Brian Murphy, who now works for, uh, I forget my Baylet guitars or something like that. He was the sales guy. And I said, I know you guys got stuff upstairs there that is not out here. And there's, you've got to have, and I was obsessed with GNL right at the time. Cause Robert Poss got me into them and he let me fish around in boxes upstairs at Alex music on 48th street. And I found this blue, uh, GNL SC two. And it was the, the second generation, not the first generation. So a little different shape. I was home at my parents' house in Oregon. What is that? An SC two. It, it, there's no uh, bass. I'm like fucking devastated it, here, man. Yeah. A single <laughs> coil, uh, SC two, single coil two, meaning two single coil pickups. Okay. It's a GNL guitar, George and Leo, um, of a Fender guitar is the company after they sold to CBS that they started and they made amazing instruments. I still have three of them. They're incredible. Um, and I, I, I was at my parents' house. I just changed strings on the guitar and I came in like a couple hours later and I hadn't tuned it. I picked it up and I strummed it and it was a dominant seven chord. And I go, Ooh, that sounds good. And I came up with this bluesy kind of lick just on that guitar. So it's just, that's the bass on the guitar that that on the uh, on the song is that guitar tuned down to a floppy ass a okay uh, so it's yeah it's and it's it's a like say an a dominant uh, seven chord and i came up with these chords and this weird thing and and uh, the song itself my great my my grandfather uh everett hamilton who's uh, went by bones bone uh, grandpa bones he uh used to be a great storyteller and he, he sounded like i played for my father and mother the smithsonian um, Woody Guthrie thing where he's talking about his songs. And I said, who does this remind you of? And he said, my dad was like, my, my father, he has that o- Oki, that Oklahoma drawl. And he used to tell these great stories. And, his, and uh, my great grandma Momo had cooked some, um, this is in their one room dirt floor shack in, in like uh, New Mexico, I believe when they started to move further and further West. And 
um, uh, had made these biscuits and they were um, she overcooked them and they had this dog, a black uh, lab mutt mix called smut. Oh, my God. That was the dog's name. And so she they kept smut outside on a on a on a leash or whatever. And so Momo threw them out the window, these biscuits. And so smut ate these dried overcooked biscuits. And I, I just thought it was the funniest story. And I started thinking about um, like, you know, Badlands, that movie and like this, that era in, in, in America before ser- uh, serial killers were a household name, you know, household names. And I got that whole, I just got this whole wacky idea of this, uh, this kind of serial killers within this, you know, based on this dog. I don't know. It was just this crazy, crazy lyrics. And I was still kind of a, a little bit in my stream of conscious, you know, uh, non, um, uh, I, I, well, I, I, you know, the the songs were kind of collections of images back then. I, I there was no narrative necessarily, but I kind of turned it into this uh, that song. And that's that uh, that's it. It's a it's a fun song to play, but we don't. I don't do that the specific tuning. I just tune down to an A, and we have bass on it live, and it's uh, it's 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 really fun. And the, the vocals I did in my, I believe I did those vocals and the song Rolo in on my four track. Um, in my apartment that I, when I had left my wife, um, my, my then, you know, my now ex-wife, my then girlfriend, um, and I was living on my own at this four track. Um, how many marriages recall- you, you've been through in your career? Just one marriage. Yeah. Oh, that's, married- that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Not too bad. A couple, uh, uh, had a long relationship after, after that, uh, four or five years after that for three years and, and a couple of others that, you know, it's just basically one string of failures after another. So <laughs> experiences. Yeah experiences yeah you gotta reframe that <laughs> for, the, for, the poor, for the poor women they uh, they end up in songs uh somehow or inspiring songs but i'm i think i was meant to to you know suffer in relationships and feel pain so i could write Ooh, just i think we got yeah. two two disclo- two things that you've probably never talked about before that you're influenced by george benson i don't think anybody would pluck that name out if they said, "Hey, who's paging?" and biscuits for smut was actually biscuits for smut. I mean, that's yeah, the, the dog smut. <laughs> that is yeah, awesome, I, man. Seeing George Benson, uh, I saw him a couple of times, and once he played at the uh, Greek Theater in Berkeley, California, which was a about a six seven hour drive from Southern Oregon, six hour drive, and we actually a bunch of us went down from Eugene when we were in college, and um, I was one of those geeks that would you know, get there really early and be, so I could be in the front row because mm-hmm. it was festival seating back then. I did that for Matheny and for Benson. And, uh, at when we, everybody kind of blasted up to the front of the stage at one point, even though I was in the first row, wait, just, I got to be right on the stage, right in front of him. I watched him just ripping and he drops his pick and didn't miss a beat, started playing West Montgomery style with his thumb. <laughs> I mean, just an absolute monster. I have actually, I was in a, a place called Tour Supply, and I'm good friends with those guys o- over there. And I walk in one day. This is by my locker in in Burbank, where we keep our music gear. And and um, um, Alan, one of my buddies that works there, is in there. And I see this case, and it says Benson on it. And I'm like, um, w- what's the deal with that guitar? And he goes, Yeah, it's a George Benson model. And I'm like, Oh, really? It says Benson on. He goes, Yeah, it's George's guitar. And I was like, Are you fucking shitting me? And I had this cut on my finger. I had a Band-Aid and I sliced my finger cutting a bagel or something stupid. And I was like, well, do you think I can? He's like, yeah, I think it would be cool. So it was his Ibanez George Benson model. Pull it out. He's got uh, clear plastic tape over the F holes, obviously, to keep it from feeding back. Um, And he let me play the guitar. I've got a little recording of me playing and I'm just crapping my pants and I had to take the Band-Aid off. So... I'm like George's sweat and soul were getting into my blood. <laughs> <laughs> I like to look at it like that. George would probably be disgusted and <laughs> but I, and so I have photos of myself and little video of me playing like "Darn That Dream" or "Beautiful Love" or something on George Benson's guitar. And uh, so it was it was kind of kind of amazing. I've, I've had I have kind of amazing luck when it comes to things like that you know just that i happened to be there the day they were shipping george's guitar somewhere for tour his tech had brought it in and yeah it was pretty pretty incredible so you don't know he might have he might have played that gig that night and said oh my god this is like what it this is the best gig yeah. i've had <laughs> you know it yeah. could be you could be the secret sauce there page you know? yeah yeah how could 
feel, how come I feel like screaming into the microphone? You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, another great song off Betty, Milk Toast. You get that melodic break in the middle and it's really cool because there's like this sort of movement and then it, it seems to increase the, the tempo and then like this the song closed like you get everybody amped up and then the song closes out and it was like i wanted more <laughs> what what's the backstory to that song um if you remember and it was a while ago we we got asked to do that crow soundtrack and and there was a little period there where uh, butch vig became a friend of ours and he he was producing that we wanted butch to do an album but he'd gotten just huge with nirvana and sure. um obviously then garbage got huge and he, he kept saying, well, I got this band. I made this album and we're just going to try to do a couple of shows. I don't know if anything will happen with it. And so it ended up garbage got huge and we never had time to get together. But he did the uh, Encomium, the Led Zeppelin tribute song we did with David Yao, as well as uh, Milk Toast. And so we did it for The Crow. And then we ended up, I liked it and wanted it on the, on the Betty album. Um, the, uh, the, the structure of the song, I kind of prided myself in, in trying to come up with, with new forms um, so it wasn't just intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. And so that was the that was the basically the unsung strong song structure. There's a couple of forms that I, I'm pretty, pretty proud of what will be unsung and Sinatra. Those two. So um, the Sinatra form is I applied to the song Pure, which you were talking about that you heard. And that's uh, it was just uh, like great um, lyrics in that song. man. I love the lyrics. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, those were those were uh, the 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 milk toast thing. I got this idea to do like you know, here's this kind of outro so, uh, solo, but it's a solo with chords, um, and so I'm superimposing these chords over on top of the the, the 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 bass changes basically. And I had guitar chords in the bass, and then I was superimposing. I was taking the upper tertials of the chord and playing these kind of rhythmic things. And as you know, the time signature kind of changes and it's got this six feel and um, yeah, it just was fun, really fun. I love that kind of thing. Now we extend that ending to let the drummer, sh you know, our drummer Kyle show off. And that kind of started with uh, Matt Flynn, I think who from uh, Maroon five, who he and I had a band together called Gandhi and um, uh, Matt said, you should extend that and I'll do, you know, I can do fills and Matt was a, <laughs> was a really yeah, a, a really, really creative uh, uh, drummer and great musician. You don't hear it in a band where it's like, you know, it's a pop mainstream band yeah. and everything is snapped to the grid and Pro Tools and whatever. They don't let him show off, really. I think live maybe they do. I don't know. But Matt's a phenomenal musician. And, um, yeah, so that's – we kind of extend extend that. We do that ending. You know, we also do the ending, the, the song uh, Birth Effect. <laughs> Matt had a great idea to go, like, to end the song and then start the, the – the, the, add a tag at, at the end and we do that still live and his arrangements for see you dead that tempesta played on um, size matters and uh, also song everybody loves you those are matt's drum arrangements oh very cool and tempesta who's a world-class drummer himself just said i i love this arrangement there's nothing really i should can do differently you know and so he just uh, he, he did it so it's uh, it's cool i like to give matt credit he's a really really incredible musician seeing eye dog 2010, I felt that that was noticeably, I'm going to say the terms, less angry. And I was curious mm. what was going on in your life then. And I love the song White City, man. It's a great tune on there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I like that song too. I ended, ended up getting, you know, in Austin, Texas, they, they do those blind dates or vote it, call in and vote and end up getting some bunch of radio airplay. And we never released any singles, at, you know, at, since we had left the major label and had no financial backing. But um, White City is sp uh, specifically about a song, uh, a town called White City, which is on the outskirts of Medford, Oregon, where I grew up. And that's where the VA domiciliary is. And as well as um, and there, there, it's kind of a poverty stricken area. There are a lot of Mexicans out um, in that part of town. And I just thought that, um, a, you know, a, a way out of here um, that, you know, the, the, the I don't know, just the, the um, just the song about that city. I mean, it has all these all these connotations, you know, race, uh, racism, and and you know, poverty, and just the you know, that's like or everybody thinks of Oregon as this um, you know liberal, forward thinking place, but there are there are some you know we have our share of issues here as well, you know, and um, yeah, I like that song. the uh, The album, I don't know, anger. The seeing eye dog dog song is, is probably the angry song, and I don't do it live because it's just a ball breaker. It's um, and I, you know, I have to be really warmed up and well into a tour 
the song Die Alone and that one are really, really hard for me to, um, uh, to, to sing night in and night out, night out. So if you ever hear it done, tune down, like, tune down, tune down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I love, I love doing, I love the songs. Just, it's just, uh, I have to be like, you know, six or seven songs into a tour and have the gravel kind of built up a little bit. And, uh, uh, plus it's, I cannot play that riff and sing at the same time. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's, that's kind of, kind of tricky. So, um, yeah, the, um, uh, seeing eye dog, I think was the first album we'd done in a, I, I can't remember if we, the order we had done a couple in a row size matters and then monochrome went through some label issues. Right. Um, and had a lawsuit, another stupid lawsuit, uh, from somebody screwing us over. Um, and uh, yeah, which is not uncommon, unfortunately. In, in the music business? That's so weird. Weird. I know that someone <laughs> would try to take advantage of a, a musician. Never and, heard you know, that. Yeah, use them use them, and make money off of our art. Yeah, I know. It's great. Isn't it great? But, uh, yeah, seeing yeah. Eye Dog was six years from um, the album before it, which was Monochrome. Yeah. Yeah, we that went through a real- You seem less, less angry. You seem, or, you know. Phase. Yeah, I don't know. The, the song- um, I was kind of exploring, I think, themes. The song Welcome to Algiers is one of my favorites on there, and we still do that live a lot. Um, also, um, In Person's on that record, I believe. Yes, that, In Person. It's a great song. There's a bunch of songs we do um, live from that that one, and I think I was into this, like the song um, Welcome to Algiers is kind of, I had this kind of Bowie vibe, you know, like uh, like the, these these melodic guitar parts at the end interspersed with feedback. And that was kind of Chris Trainer's idea. He said, why don't you do like kind of play solo it, solo-ish parts and then have feedback kind of coming in. I'm like, I love that idea. And so it was ended up kind of being this cool outro. And I think I was imagining something like not boys keep swinging, but something off a of lodger or um, what, what era, you know, that era Bowie, which is mm. I think my favorite, the low lodger heroes um and scary monsters that those are that's kind of my favorite period of bowie um and scary monsters was a huge influence on dead to the world because that's i i have you know right down to having this kind of instrumental break uh instrumental noises uh, ushering in um uh, the, the you know not the beginning of the album but guru and then the end of the album um and the the song guru is an absolute nod to scary monsters um guitar stuff but um yeah, I don't know. I love. I was really, really had a, f- a fun time. I did that album with Toshi Kasai. We did uh, Seeing Eye Dog, and it was, I think, the first album with Kyle um, Stevenson. Um, and um, yeah, I, I love love playing those songs live. And I never thought about like the level of anger or anything like that because um, I'm just I'm still just writing songs and and, and you know try, trying to do something that I'm excited sure. uh, excited. So, well, that's why I asked it, what was going on in your life. Was that like a, a mellow period of time? Were you like uh, in love and going home every night and eating dinner together with somebody or something? You know? Yeah. Uh, Stan, you used to tease me. He's like, oh, now you got your, your, your are you going to go up in the woods and write, write aftertaste and you're going to be sitting out there with squirrels on a, <laughs> like in communing with nature. Then it's going to be crazy. <laughs> I like no, I, I think I think you carry everything. All the ex- life experiences you have um, are, are stay with you, and um, and I never try to consciously uh, 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 apply anything. I, and I, I don't I don't think well, I have to be more angry or less angry, or people yeah. expect this or expect that. I go, I want to write an album that I'm excited about, and love, and um, that album is one of my is I love the last two a, a, a lot. They're really fun to really fun to play, and I feel also that. Like I, I want, uh, like when you go through a period where you, there are a couple songs, like I say, like seeing eye dog or, uh, insatiable off of, um, aftertaste that are hard for me to sing and play. I wanted stuff that I could, I would definitely add to the set, um, and play, play live. And I want to kind of this thing to you know make sure that everything we do is performable. Like, and, and I loved a song like LA water that that was really interesting to do like 85 tracks and strings and guitars and uh, feedback and stuff, but it's, we never do it live cause it's, it's a different kind of song for us. And it requires those it's building, building layers kind of. Um, and it's not about the, 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 um, the rhythmic arrangement so much as the, as this kind of vertical, uh, layers of, 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 so, of so, kind of sonic thing. And, you know, if I had my druthers, we'd have a, 
um, we'd do a tour with an orchestra and, and I'd have seven guitar, guitar players on stage, <laughs> do, you know, do something like Metallica did with the orchestra, only, you know, do, you know, d- different, my chords. And sure. D- hey, you mentioned after t- I never ask about album covers cause it's like too, too like f- common. Everybody else asks about it, but I love yeah. your, your covers in general are great, but aftertaste in particular, mm. I remember looking at that and even energy was coming off of that cover. Like you could, there was just like, you could, in, I was able to sit there, start thinking about, wow, there's like a million different scenarios going through my head as to what can be going on. How did that cover come about? It is so cool. I would always look, I always get, get a kind of a basic idea for an album cover like Betty. Um, I had this, you know, English garden and a woman, uh, you know, outdoor. And we found these uh, photos, uh, this collection of fo- uh, photographs from this f- Florida photographer and um, the water skiing thing I thought was great. And I thought it was very unmetal. And since we've gotten the metal Grammy nomination, I thought this will be, you know, funny. Um, I love that, that you do. I love that there's certain things you do. Cause I'm like this and my wife, like, chides me for it's not chides me but she's like i know what you're gonna do i like that you do things just because like someone thinks you're not supposed to do it because i don't know and i know it's childish or i know that people say it's childish but i'm the same way because it's like you know i hate to just not i I don't it's just i feel good when i do that not at any basis not to hurt somebody you know i don't mean doing something that's going to be mean but like i i I just i can't stand when i'm supposed to do something yeah just challenge you know i really hate that like it uh, you know forcing you know not forcing someone to think because they're going to come to it or they're not And, and i think with that one i this this notion of the music business and businessmen and kind of coming out of this fog i'd found this photo um, and also the, 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 the sponge with the dripping water. And, and I said, let's we turn this photo on, on its side. And, it's, you know, I think that's the, that's the album cover uh, the inside of the back or whatever, uh, is the, the sponge with the water. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, and then those guys, there were, the guy was actually carrying a briefcase and I thought, well, yeah, you know, yeah. then there were three, it was just the three of us. I did all the guitars on that album. Um, cause I just, I felt like it was, I didn't like, uh, I didn't like feel the responsibility of worrying about the second guitar player having something to play. I, I just wanted to, you know, do everything myself. And it's because I was essentially doing everything myself anyway, guitar wise. And, and so I said, you know what, uh, Peter and Rob were great, but uh, at this point I just want to do the guitars and it's just the three of us is the, that's the core of the band. And so there are three, these three guys kind of coming, walking through a fog bank or coming out of the dust or the rubble or something. And I just thought it was a really interesting, interesting image. And I liked the tone of it. And then um, found the pictures of the burning oil field uh, for the, um, for the inside cover for the lyrics. I just thought that was another beautiful image. So uh, there's not really a ton of, uh, you know, meaning behind it, but I always, there always is something I love. I was a big fan of hypnosis, uh, Hardy, the Led Zeppelin and uh, Pink Floyd. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he just uh, died. The, you and know, uh, the covers. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Storm Thur- Thurgison, I think was his name. He, he oh, just my God. in about six to this last year, I think. Yeah. The, the Led Zeppelin presence, um, 10 mm. CC De- deceptive bands, Pink Floyd, wish you were here. Those albums had huge impact. Those, co- yeah. those covers impact on my, um, my love of our album artwork. Mm. And so that's, I think uh, we, you know, B- Betty and Aftertaste, and certainly Dead to the World. Those albums are absolutely inspired by that. So totally, man, Dead to the World. Let's talk about Dead to the World. So before I listen to it, man, I got to be honest. I said, okay, uh, I would imagine things are going to slow down a bit. Uh, uh-uh. uh, that's a. I, I, I should not assume that with you ever, um, because that thing rocks you know and then the album cover you're right it's very hypnosis like it's like very it's a stoic image it's the guys walking away from you it was super freaking cool but um a few songs i want to talk you talked about green shirt i love that song um except expect the world beautiful your beautiful vocals in there man i mean that's that that song took forever to get to get to that uh, place that it, we ended up recording. That was originally a Gandhi song, and that that verse groove is something Matt Flynn again came up with a million years ago, and we recorded it with my great 
friend and, and another uh, a hero of mine, David Torn, the great, um, uh, great, I don't know what you call him, composer, guitarist, avant-garde, whatever, just genius, an absolute genius. And I, and I to, uh, want to pat myself on the back because when I was playing with Bowie, I gave him a David Torn splatter cell CD and I said, this is a guitar player you need to be working with. And Torn did the next three Bowie albums. Um, and Torn was the producer, was co-producing the Gandhi stuff at this place called Applehead and um, in um, upstate New York in Woodstock. And there was a book. Oh, like, Bearsville? Uh, no, and it's called Apple Applehead. Okay. Um, yeah, but but it, it's not far from Bearsville. But there was a, you know, even a broken um, mic pre on the on the um, on the console and David Torn put a room mic on the on the broken mic pre and we used that for Flynn's breakdown in the middle section and so that that song kind of oh no that was uh everybody loves you there was something on on expect the world too from the the gaudy days but i ended up took me a long time to get to that place where i i, I had a, a, a quote unquote chorus i because there was originally i had no chorus i had this other other section after the verses and i always I, I got that idea expect the world was the new york times tagline back in the I guess oh, it would have been 90 your, your know. Okay. Yeah, you see the New York Times ad and it was like it said expect the world um and it they were on bus stops everywhere and I and just the 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 notion of trying to tailor your um t- tailor your pr- not just your art, your music or anything, your personality to to you know cater to some group of people your you know oh my friends this social group or you know stat the social status the whole notion of of social status and um you know my with that kind of sneering you know sarcastic tone that i i I guess i favor too much but um yeah i loved i loved and you know the, the the I had this kind of major, major to minor, simple chord thing and, and came up with a melody and um, the the key, the little guitar line in the background was originally I did it at home in my apartment on a keyboard. I had this synth called a virus and it was when I was working with the Nine Inch Nails guys and they were turning me on to these cool synths and all this keyboard stuff and sampling and they got me into Logic Audio and stuff. And so there was that song was a it was a happened over the course of many years and um yeah I'm, I'm fond of it. we haven't done it live yet but it's a beautiful we'll, song man and i love cool. the i love the you know i got the a very much a redemption vibe out of that song yeah you know and um but what i liked about it is at the end it really leaves you feeling optimistic and the the, the lyrics it's great to be alive expect the world like yeah it's pretty freaking optimistic right you can't like optimistic but also a little tongue-in-cheek a little a little bit like yeah not really it's kind of like <laughs> nick cave doing it's a wonderful world you know um, <laughs> yeah yeah a little bit like oh my you know i think they he might have done a video for something and it's like the, the war and death and destruction and so there is a little bit of that may you know it's there's there is optimism but also kind of a sadness to it to me you know a little bit so and then uh Look alive, and then life or death. Those are the last two tracks. They again, they kind of feel like struggle and winning. And I was curious, did you originally write them to tie into one another? Because you couldn't, like the perfect tie into one. To, to uh, the the life, life or death slow. Life or death. I, I can't remember if I call them life or death slow. Yeah. Fast, you call, or no, you called it yeah. look alive, and then life or death slow. Yeah, those. The, uh, the, I like the idea of slow death, slow life, um, and and that's why I used that. But that was specifically inspired by Bowie. Uh, it's no game, and it's no game part two, where he did like a slower version at the end of the album of it's no game, and uh, so. But I just was kind of a play on words with the life or death slow. That was um, originally kind of I came up with those chords um, and that melody. Um, when my father was still alive and I was, there was this, um, I'm trying to remember, you know, a recliner ain't no dynamo. Just like that's the American dream is to sort of retire in your armchair and watch and get in and, and experience life from through the news or, and that's kind of the American way in the West and Western world is sort of, uh, we're in a sheltered, you know, sheltered society considering how big we are. And this, I think when, September 11th happened. It was such a shock that someone would attack us, and it's 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 always been been out there. We're just kind of oblivious oblivious to it, and so that's um, and I and that just uh, this sort of cynical notion that 
you know, there's a school shooting and there's mass death and it's big news today and tomorrow and we forget about it three days from now. And it's, you know, uh, uh, it's life or death doesn't matter to, to it's just news at a certain point. And that's kind of what that song's about. Look mm-hmm. Alive was the last song I wrote and I got the I got the idea I was in Sacramento actually walking to a Pete's Coffee and I saw this big billboard that said, uh, Oh God, I got to remember it now. Sacramento, uh, 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 beauty. Um, Oh man, I think I used it in, in, in the song, the lyric, I can't remember right now. Cause I have that other song. I had, um, uh, uh, beautiful is, is, oh, God dang it. I have to look at the, uh, Hey, look alive. You on the outside. spotless on the outside. Um, Anyway, it was that that notion that women specifically are um, they need to be sort of mag, you know magazine airbrushed in order for us to accept them, and what what women go through in our in our culture and the and the you know this discrimination is it's still you know it's still rampant. They don't get an equal wage. They don't. They aren't treated. You know, we're we're it's it's coming out more and more that what people have. Uh, gone through, to, you know, in in the workplace, whether they're actresses in, in a, a scumbag like Harvey Weinstein, or in the in an in an office, and that we that we judge them differently, age, age, and their physical appearance. And so there's this it's a sad, really sad song, you know, "Hey, look alive, you're spotless on the outside." You know, I won't be surprised you get what you need. And there's, so there's kind of an evil there at the same same time. Like, why am I not remember beauty? Sacramento beauty has arrived or it's like first wax and uh, laser treatment free or something, something. <laughs> That's idea. like, yeah, yeah. You see those all over, man. Yeah. I write, um, I, I, keep, I keep notes when I'm traveling around, whether I'm in my car or on tour and I write things that I think are funny um, uh, down or just will jar, will, uh, uh, you know, end up jarring a whole song loose. It's sort of a collection of, <laughs> of words, a story, some kind of thing. And that's the, so yeah, those, I, uh, I kind of were, uh, I glue, you know, seem to work well together, kind of glued them together with this wall of, I like to do, um, sort of, uh, d- d- you know, collages as, as well. Like we're all just record the song, um, on the B side for the Bowie cover that we're going to release the, uh, for these the seven inch covers with, that uh, our, our artwork, um, was a song called more bad news. And it was basically the bad news. I took the cellos and the, the 12 string, um, electric guitars from that and had Kyle play this. I had this beat in my brain for 10 years. I said, just play this beat for three minutes. and I'm going to use it, chop it up, <laughs> create this thing. So I did the flip the, the vocals upside down and just play this beat for vocals. three minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, so it's, I've had it in really, my head for 10 years. I love that. <laughs> couldn't get it out. Couldn't get it out of my head. And I said, I got to record this thing. Just do it. And Kyle was like, of course, you know, so yeah, that's how that kind of, um, so those bits end up be kind of creating a, the, the, cause I still like the album experience. I still, I think raised on concept albums to a certain extent, you know, Pink Floyd is, you know, has uh, influenced all of us at, at, at some point, you know? Um, I'm just writing that down, man. Just, uh, this, this, that's hilarious. Just play this beat for three minutes. I've had it in my head for 10 years. <laughs> That's classic, man. Um, what were over your career, man? What were some of the the low points or the more challenging times, and how did you manage to get through them? And like, you know, at least for me, when I'm it's it's when I'm at a low point, all of a sudden that guy on my shoulder who has been like gone for six months or a year or two years or three years since the last low point, he pops mm-hmm. up and then he starts whispering in my fucking ear. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have that, but how, how did you like, what were some of the low points and how did you fight off any negative messages that you might've gotten at that time? I think, uh, you know, ironically the, uh, after the success of meantime, that, that was kind of a low point. As I say, I destroyed myself with, you know, drugs and alcohol for a while and, and ended up leaving my then, uh, f- uh fiance and my, you know, uh, best friend who was kind of my rock and brilliant woman. And I just blew that relationship. And I just, um, so it kind of, I was in a pretty shitty, shitty place when I was, uh, right and Betty, but I, I, the, the music and the the guitar kind of kept, kept me focused. And then, uh, at that same time in that same apartment that I was in is when Kurt, uh, Cobain, uh, killed himself. And we were, we were, 
acquaintances. We were friendly. Um, we had played together back before they had Grohl in the band and then after they had Grohl in the band. And this was pretty devastating for, for us. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I just kind of dove into the music and, and kind of forgot about everything. And once I finally put my nose to the grindstone and started writing songs, um, it kind of pulled me, pulled me out of it. But um, um, also when then at, at the end of the, the, the first uh, incarnation of Helmet, when John and Henry decided to call it a day, that was a tough period because I didn't re- I didn't want the band to break up. I thought we should take a year off because we've been touring so intent and, and uh, you know, intensively and uh we had spent so much time together and it was kind of this steady um upward climb and then uh, all at once the rug was pulled out from under me and i had no vehicle i had no band to write songs for so i kind of spun out for a couple of years and um that's when i decided to eventually leave new york after september 11th happened and i knew i needed to to regroup and it was a it was a big move like that that i needed to kind of uh, keep myself from uh, from falling apart. I had got, I did get the call from Bowie in 99 and that kind of pulled me, got, got me out of the party mode. Cause I had to learn 30 Bowie songs in two weeks and then go play Wembley stadium. And <laughs> in front of a That'll people. do it. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. If I get my shit together. Um, this is, you know, I got, if I fuck up rebel rebel, the whole world will want to hang me. So, um, I did. The, uh, that was really a, a key moment. And then not long after that, I decided it was just time to get to the West coast and, um, you know, Los Angeles made made sense because it's another massive city and there's culturally there's so much going on. And I just needed the change at the time. Um, and um, it took me a while to get to adjust because, as you know, it's so different. And you're sitting there at midnight in your place and going, like, well, let's see, I can't bars close at one thirty. I would normally be walking out of my apartment in the East Village right now at one o'clock in the morning and clo- you know, closing down two a and until 5.00 AM. Yeah. You have um, like a million choices. Like, yeah. Oh, what am I going to do tonight? It's 1.00 AM. I got 15 places open within a eight minute walk. And I had my work habits had started to kind of regroup a little bit and I was writing and then I could just, I could eat dinner and write for a couple hours and go out and drink beer until the sun came up. And I knew I had to get out of there. And then like I say in Los Angeles was, can be pretty lonely, but I slowly kind of got into the groove and I met John Tempesta and he and I started playing and that was really key because I got back on track and then I got a call from Jimmy Iovine to make a, another helmet record. So everything sort of, you know, kicked into high gear at that point. And I felt, um, and I said, why not? You know, I, I, I'm proud of, and I had a great conversation. I've had many great conversations, but I mentioned in earlier, Danny Korchmar, the great guitarist and compo- and uh, uh, producer. And he said, you know, and I was like, yeah, this whole guitar thing. I said, I'm sick of it. You know, everybody's like, you know, has an opinion about what you're, what you're doing. I'm just doing this keyboard stuff that the Nine Inch Nails guys turn me on to. I'm running, I've got these synths and this Kurzweil and all this stuff. And he said, Paige, you're a guitarist. He goes, you need to be heard. Your people, he said, he said, uh, Jimi Hendrix wrote songs and to, to, to be heard and have his guitar playing heard. That's what, that's who you are. That's what you are. You're a guitarist and a singer. And, um, it was like that coming from someone like that. We have yeah. carried a lot of weight, you know, cause I have nothing but respect for Cooch. And, um, so yeah, I just kind of turned it around and, um, and I, I can't remember if there had been, the, there were low points after that where th- where I got pretty badly screwed by a record company after Interscope, not Interscope. Interscope was always amazing. And those, uh, Jimmy was, was amazing. And, uh, they were always very supportive, but I think the industry had changed so much at that point, um, that they just, you know, weren't going to put the same amount of energy and, and money into a band like helmet that they did on the first album that they released meantime. Um, cause they'd sold like a gazillion records with no doubt nine inch nails, and Dr. Dre and Eminem and, um, all those folks. Um, and we were just, we were still at the end of the day, we're still like a not incredibly accessible and there's a, there are accessible things, but we're not a mainstream pop. Yeah. Band you're, or, an, you're an indie niche almost i hate these words cult but you're an you know you have yeah. your followers you know you're an a, a niche an indie niche band yeah so expecting like radio hits is just was was kind of silly and i wasn't going to be sit, sit, sitting around trying to write radio hits it's not in me you know? no I just don't, no don't care i just don't care about i don't listen to pop rock radio and um you know i still am who i am so 
Um, I think, but, it's, and it that's was, why, and that's why helmet worked though. I also have to say, I think when I talk to younger bands that I produce and I say, don't do what the record company thinks you should do or your manager. And I've seen so many bands. I said, look, my band will be 30 years old next year, 2019. And we're still touring the world and still performing at a high level and love what I'm doing. Like, are we playing Madison Square Garden? No, but we might play to 200 people one night or, you know, 10,000 at a festival or, you know, 1500 of our own fans in Belgium or whatever it is. And I said, because we're, we're honest, we're doing what we love. We're not trying. And I've worked with so many bands. And I said, don't do this. You're going to regret it later. I had a singer from a band. I won't say who took, t- I um, met him. He was, he's delivering chickens at a place in LA and um, they were in their twenties when I worked with them and I made a pretty good record with them, but they kept shooting themselves in the foot and, and questioning me. And then we, we, uh, the album got put back because we had to fire the guitar players because there were drugs involved and then helmet went to europe and so i left and came back and they had fucked the record all up and um you know the pressure of the record company and their manager and stuff i think influenced they let it influence the music and i said you're the ones that have to live with these songs you're playing these songs they're not so stick to your guns and do the music that you believe in and um and then he took me to lunch he said can i take you out to lunch i said he said you were right everything you said was right I said, yeah, I wasn't, you know, blowing smoke up your ass to, for, you know, to hear myself talk. I'm just yeah. trying to let you learn from my, no, learn from my experience. And this is what I think. If you trust me, then, you know, great. If you don't, then, and it's, it's, I've seen it happen time and time again, where these bands think, Hey, we're going to be the next nine inch nails. And I go, well, there's already nine inch nails. So why don't you just be, you know, you and do something that you can be proud of and and um it's it's not an uncommon thing though unfortunately so yeah i mean if you want to if you can talk about the bowie story i know you've said it a hundred times if not that's totally cool but i know and you mentioned he called called you up to work at a vulnerable point in your life but if you could talk about that and also maybe share a cool story about your experience in working with him and like what you what was the biggest takeaway for you there were many that I think the biggest takeaway was the confidence it gave me that this guy said he was a fan of my band. And I've had that, I've spoken with, you know, hung out with Billy Gibbons a couple of times and had a beer with Neil Young at the back staircase of, of the, after a concert and, and, uh, you know, had kind of had a dinner, had a dinner party with Elton John and to have these guys say, I like your band. It's kind of amazing. Cause you're a 12 year old kid and you're listening to, yeah. you know, <laughs> Captain Saturday Fantastic. Or, <laughs> yeah and it's and uh kind of mind-blowing but with bowie to meet him at a festival in 97 and have him say it's like helmet i love helmet you know and i it would just crack me i started laughing and i said yeah right whatever and he goes oh we go way back but anyway two years later he phoned and and um asked me to play lead, lead guitar with him for that tour and it was a great experience it was obviously uh, it kind of snapped me out of a bad party phase and um, and got me kind of headed in the right direction. And, and it's not easy music to learn because it's, you're covering 30 years at that time of material sounds from, you know, diamond dogs to, uh, to, to, to tin machine, you know, like I can't read that are a completely experimental guitar sounds and stuff. And, um, so it was, a, it was really good for me. It really helped me focus and, uh, and get kind of back into it and go, wow, I can, I can do this. And I said to him, I said, I'm not really a guitarist per se i said and he's like what are you talking about i said i kind of consider myself a shit sculptor you know i'm just doing <laughs> I'm, exper- I'm experimenting but i'll go back to hagberg talking about ornette coleman in the lab coat i said i kind of came up with my own vocabulary for the guitar and i love jazz music so i have these things and kind of are smashed together and i said I never was a classic rock i never really learned classic rock and you could you could call at this point rebel rebel classic rock and uh, I did. It was really good for me to learn all that stuff. And I would learn some Nick Ronson solos and some, uh, you know, a little bit of what Reeves Gabrels did. And Reeves and I are friends and I have great admiration for him. And um, it was so it was a great uh, it was a great challenge to kind of, kind of come up with the sounds. And Bowie said to me, I think he nailed the sound in Rebel Rebel. And I um, but it was it was also kind of overwhelming because we're playing at Wembley Stadium and Mick Jagger is standing t- 10 feet from me on stage, you know, going, you know, wondering who the hell this heavy metal dipshit is. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was funny. You know, it was, a, it was a really funny experience. But he, I think among the many things that I learned from him, he um, he said uh, he was we, we both chain smoked back then. And he turned to me at one point and he said, 
he's like, you know, I won't do his accent, but he's like Danny K, the inchworm. And he said, advice for budding young songwriters. And he looks right at me and he said, I nicked half my songs from Danny K, the inchworm. And I was like, interesting, because John Coltrane did the inchworm. Ba da, ba da da. You know, and uh, I was like, that's kind of an in- interesting that they, it sort of came full circle with this, you know, the inchworm, this child children's song or whatever. But um, he also, I mean, so he talked about Roy Orbison influencing, uh, 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 do you remember? Ashes to Ashes. Um, uh, and just yeah. Interesting, interesting things and it was great to watch him play guitar he had that old folky kind of thing you'd play his a chord with three fingers and move it up a whole step to play a b chord instead of barring it and just there are just a lot of little things and seeing he i suggested we do repetition from lodger it was always an intense uh, uh, song about uh, about domestic abuse and and uh we did it one day everybody learned it and he's like he's like whose idea was that he goes that was yours, right, Pagey? And he said, tall, skinny blondes think alike, because I had my hair bleached white at the time or whatever. <laughs> I was like, yes, you're tall, I guess. And yeah, we're both brilliant. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah me and you, we're like this. Anyway, there were just, there were, he, I ate Chinese food with him at LaGuardia Airport, you know, with just the four of us, Sterling Gale and David and I were going up to do the Much Music Awards. And that was an interesting uh, experience just to have him. I kind of kept to myself because everybody's always trying to get their moment with him. And I I was kind of he called me his quiet one and which my, my mother would tell you I'm anything but quiet. But I I didn't feel like I needed my moment with him necessarily. Like I'm going to try to like I'm with David. I just I was an honor to play his music It was an honor to be around him. Uh, to see that he was a, he was a voracious reader, self-educated, essentially an eighth grade drop, you know, dropout. And just that you, that you apply yourself. And I mean, obviously he was a genius um, and he had this incredible passion for music and learning and you continue to progress. And I mean, Black Star is a great, um, an incredibly yeah. emotional, deep, beautiful album. It's yeah. crushing. I mean, it's just crushingly beautiful. Um and uh, yeah, it was an, it was it was, it was life changing for me, and it gave me a lot of confidence. It's like I can do this, and I found that I was the one in the band that had my own career as a as a as a leader, as a band leader, and everybody there were career side side people, you know, and great great players. But I would see sometimes frustration in them. I think that they, even though they're playing with the one of the greatest songwriters and uh, musicians of, of of all time, they, they everybody wanted to have to be able to express themselves. And so I felt, I felt pretty uh, privileged that I've had this career doing the music that I love to do as well as to get to play his music. So uh, it was a really great, uh, great experience for me. It was really good for my ears too, because you got to hear a lot of the subtleties. There's no, there, there were, I mean, there might've been charts for those songs, but you have to learn everything by ear and mm. get, get, you know, get things exactly right. Cause you can't get up there and screw it up, you know, and with the, with the man. That's great. I mean, to learn 30 songs in two weeks is, is a, and, and to have, it's not like you're learning 30 songs in two weeks and you're playing at a state fair, not to take anything away from playing at a state fair. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, 30 songs in two weeks and you're in fucking Wembley. Yeah. That, that's, that's pressure, man. It really is. Headlining, headlining the, um, the net aid concert. So 1 billion people saw us play that night. He was the last, he was the closing act after everyone, George Michael and all these people that played and we were that we were it, the headliner. And so, yeah, you had to, na- you had to nail it. You know, it was really, it was a great, uh, great experience for me. You know, I had my moments. There were, I wish I'd had a, a you know, a little more time, but um, it was, uh, it was still cool. It was a cool experience. I it sounds it. like it was a great experience for you, like in many ways. And it sounds like it really um, it changed the trajectory, the potential trajectory of your life that you might have been going down. And, no and question. It, yeah, no question. Really yeah, good. yeah. I was uh, it, like, I say, sometimes I feel like I, I'm just. I mean, incredibly fortunate, you know, to walk in the day Charlie Parker's horns, horns being installed or George Benson's guitar is about to get shipped or, you know, these things, these things that have, that have happened to me. And I'm like, that's something like some, something on, on a higher power at work. And yeah. I don't know, if, you know, my, my love of, of music and my appreciation for these things. But um, uh, it's yeah, that was a, that was a really picked me up by my bootstraps. And I was like, OK, this is you know, time to dig in and, 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 and do this. It was really amazing. So. Well, and to your credit, you didn't waste that opportunity, you know, yeah. which, which is, 
really get great. Yeah, I, I got back to to writing. I guess it would have been um, that's and then I moved to Los Angeles and I had all this material from the Gandhi um, period. And I think Gandhi was going on at the time. Um, I, I know my uh, Matt Flynn, my uh, buddy who I told you about, and Christian, the bass player, they met Bowie. They came by rehearsal one day, and uh, Christian was completely like paralyzed. He didn't know what to say or what to do or whatever. <laughs> and uh, uh, Matt was his, his his usual self, humble, but you know funny comfortable matt's always been incredibly confident um well i mean i not you know since i've known him but um yeah and uh it was it was it was a really cool experience and i love the people in the band i feel like i had a good relationship with sterling we were i will I'll never forget that four o'clock in the morning us listening to the yankees uh, world series his room was next to mine he could hear two idiots screaming at four o'clock in the morning you know like um, uh, you know, we could, you know, it's coming in the next day dragon, like, what are you guys so tired for? It's like, well, the world series is going on and we can't miss a game, you know? <laughs> and I noticed your Yankee shirt earlier, man. Very good. Yep. Got this, got this in the stadium. When one of my great friends uh, took me there for my birthday, uh, right at the end of the tour to see the Astros. And, uh, so I got this, uh, friend, Tony Fortuna who's a phenomenal drummer that I played with in, uh, Brooklyn band in the in the eighties, actually with the guys from Malumbo. So um, that I'm doing a recording with or have recorded with. And you, you mentioned this album that we're going to put out eventually. It should be out by now, but they're just dragging their asses. So, hey, um, let's talk gear for a few minutes. Yeah, are you a gear? You have tons of guitars. I do. Yeah, I have a lot of guitars. Yeah, it just kind of happened happens by accident. I got obsessed with Robert Johnson, so. Uh, Bonnie, who used to work at Paul Reed Smith, found me a 1936 Gibson L00, and then I, I I wanted an electric 12 string. So Nikki Scopolidis had John Entwistle's 1965 Candy Apple Red Fender 12, and I've had that forever. Wow. Um, uh, Uli Uli Teufel was a fan, and he came to my apartment in New York, and I played the Birdfish for an hour, and he saw that I loved it, so he asked for a helmet guitar as a um, uh, you know, it's a historical document and I, and I traded him that and I just, my friend said, you know, that guitar is worth $15,000 now. I'm like, you're kidding me. And I What's the birdfish bird, guitar? The birdfish, the Uli Teufel birdfish. It's this uh, beautiful, amazing piece of art that also happens to sound great and play great. I know Billy Gibbons has one. Um, and Randall Wallace, who owns a lair where Bowie made his last few records and who's a friend of mine, he owns one. Um, I don't know who else owns one but they're just it's a really amazing instrument so i have some cool instruments. i still have my 1952 es-175 from college um i have um i have i've got three old gnls and sc uh two sc2s and an sc3 from the, the original gnls they're the first uh, year or two of gnls um trying to think i got a, a 59 reissue gold top that i got in 86 that's a great uh, guitar what are the gibsons do i have i can't um what's, what's like your I'm sorry what's like your go-to guitar right now the one you pick up when you want to you know well i travel with my the my prs that uh that they made for me they i they kept trying to get me to play the guitars and i'm very loyal to esp because they did the page hamilton models but sure. paul Reed Smith finally came up with the mccarty and i loved it and uh so i have my my friend the great artist um and uh um singer from the band skeleton key in new york eric sanko uh, covered it with aluminum leaf and Paul Reed uh, Smith finished over it. So I travel with that. It's a solid body that's kind of less Paul vibe and it, uh, I feel safe traveling with it in a flight case. It won't get destroyed. So I have actually, we're talking about Howard Roberts. I have a, um, um, God, I don't even know what you have. 57, I believe it is 50. I think it's a 57 Howard Roberts um, Epiphone, which has been my favorite guitar at home, but I will never travel with it. It's a blonde. It was a gift from one of my best friends in New York um, and so it was kind of amazing that, that, you know, I have this, have this instrument and, uh, you know, I love Howard and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful instrument. Um, I have others and I have my signature model ESPs and I use for movies. I use the LTDs, which are, they're kind of, um, less expensive, um, and are a little heavier uh, wood, denser wood, uh, but they're great instruments. And ESP has always been, a, in my opinion, an underrated guitar company and I, did, I had no problem playing a guitar that was made in japan people used to have this purest f uh, you know uh, aesthetic and i'm like i, I love just a great instrument period sure. i pulled at that original uh, fuchsia guitar i pulled off the shelf when esp was a tiny little company on 48th street above uh, 
a 48 street custom guitars. They probably had 30 guitars and I played four or five of them. And I go, this guitar is incredible and it still sounds amazing. It's just, I love, I love it. So I don't fly with it anymore. Uh, it's just for us tours. That's great. You know, um, Alex Skolnick. Uh, we've met once. I don't know him well. We actually, my, my dear friend, Anthony Truglio, the uh, Gandhi member and a guitarist, from a band called Liege Lord and metal metal band. He and I are, he's like my, my little brother. He talked to Alex about jazz wannabes, which would be Anthony and myself and whoever else we, we were dragging along, going to open for Alex's uh, kind of jazz esque. group. Yeah. It's, tr- it's trio. He's got a trio now. Yeah. We never did. It never kind of came to uh, Alex is, I think kind of shy, not the most loquacious guy in the world or my experience. So he never, um, he did maybe he wasn't that enthused about us or I don't know because we're playing standards you know it's and he's doing like a you know an Aerosmith song but instrumentally or whatever you know his kind of thing is different and we're just we're playing you know Benny Golson and Miles Davis tunes so yeah uh, but I only mentioned because he's got a, an ESP and he he's had he's been with them for ages and he he loves them yeah and, and he yeah, does he the does same the, thing because he has LTDs that he takes you know yeah he's singer. a great musician man really great musician so. yeah. Yeah. Um, what's do you remember record? Do you remember the first CD you ever purchased, or what CD first album you ever purchased? Um, the first one I ever uh, got, I think, was a America um, Horse with No Name. That was the I heard the song on the radio. Um, I was in I was a car sick kid, and I was in the back of the station wagon. Uh, Grant and Julie, my siblings were in this, you know, mom down in the front, Grant and Julie in the next. And I was in the very back. We were winding through Oregon, which is very mountainous. And, um, and I felt car sick and this song came on the radio and I just went inside the music and was hearing this, you know, now looking back like this 12 string acoustic mm-hmm. and the bongos and the dry bass. And this, I just sort of went inside the music and it took me away from being car sick and being in the, you know, and, and I just, I went and got the record soon thereafter and just became obsessed with it. And, and, uh, then kind of, ex, you know, expanded my collection from there. My cut, co- my, uh, cousin and my parents had both bought me a copy of Rod Stewart, a night on the town for Christmas one year, whatever year that song, uh, tonight's the night was a big hit. And so I took it to pay less drugstores to exchange the extra copy. And that's when I got Led Zeppelin four. Um, and I guess I, this, this looks really cool. This guy with the bundle of sticks, and um, I took it home and I heard Black Dog and my life changed forever. And I was like, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. So I think I was 15 or something or 14 maybe because that record had been out for maybe a year or two. 72, I think it came out. But um, I think it was I think that's about the right time. So, yeah, those were two records that I remember influencing me. And there was also um, an Eagles song that my cousins used to play. Like they used to play like Kiss, The Beatles, The Monkey monkeys jim croce but there was this eagle song called already gone and that was the oh, first yeah. hard rocker i was like wow this song there's something about this i like tequila sunrise but i really like this like this is intense like what is this you know and you're you're a kid you don't really know yet and i was like this is i want to do this that's cool you know desert island discs man if i asked you to pick three it's i know always, it's ridiculous yeah. but just for give me just your knee-jerk reaction this is not a permanent desert island just yeah well i'd go with you know since, since i can have a i you know it's not a single disc i'd go with the beethoven nine symphonies you know by Car- herbert von Karajan. um and that's like i don't know how many records that is but that's <laughs> like, that counts as one disc right and i know i've always i've always said um, Miles Davis kind of blue, but I think I've listened to it so many times that I'd have to go to with Miles Smiles. Um, and then I would pick a Coltrane album, but they're so short. It's like 25 minutes is a love Supreme, but yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess it would be, um, you know, maybe that, that, that record, a love Supreme is, is, I think those were, those were huge seminal, you know, huge moments in my life. I also have listened to the Beatles revolver about 8,000 times and we've covered two songs off that record. So, um, you know, it's always, that's always tough for me, but I mean, the, the classical thing you is, is you just, I, I hear something new every time I hear those pieces. And I love, I love Ray Fawn Williams and Aaron Copeland and 
uh, Sibelius and you know, I, I it's, but uh, and Ray Fon Williams is another one that I became obsessed with his fifth symphony, as well as the Lark ascending and serenade to music. Those are all, um, kind of life changing pieces that I, I have the scores to, and I follow along with and, and, um, the Bella Bartok six string quartets as well. Those were life changing. It took me 10 years to absorb. And finally had a, one day I was actually, I told you in the, when I played the world's fair and I treated myself to three days in Madrid that cassette tape of uh, this, the fourth string quartet. And I finally, I was sat bolt upright on my bed. I'm like, Oh yeah. You know, but it took me about 10 years to have it kind of wrap my head around it, you know, cause it was so intense. It's such intense music and um, sort of a testament to sticking with something. If yeah. somebody, somebody you admire says, listen to this music is not always supposed to be immediate gratification. You know, it's, it provides, it, it's constantly providing inspiration and, intellectual stimulation spiritual stimulation all these things that it does for you so if you if you don't challenge yourself you're always going to be stuck and i mean the average listener that wants to hear uh, you know taylor swift whatever might not want to challenge themselves with bella bartok but i you know I, I think anyone that's a musician certainly should and anyone that you know has ever read a book or admired a painting you you can appreciate music on that level you know it's it's uh, it, it, it always it always pays, pays back. You know what I mean? It brings yeah. something, you know, we're never worthy. I mean, I'm never, I never feel worthy standing in, Be you know, on Beethoven's patio that he would walk on. I was, I had tears in my eyes. I'm like this great, incredible human being who had, you know, terrible skin and hemorrhoids and every health ailment you can imagine and wrote this symphony when it was, Dan, you know, stone cold death. You know, if that's not, you know, inspiring, I don't know what is. He suffered like every human being does. And he, and he wrote this beautiful, incredible music. The seventh symphony second movement will be played at my funeral. That's, um, that's the, to me, one of the great pieces of music ever written and so emotional and so Eastern influence. You think about how far East Vienna is and Austria and all those, those, those melodies and things that crept into his music and, you know, he, so he invented romantic music, in my opinion. You know, that was the beginning of the, you know, the bridge, you know, Viennese classical music, Haydn, Mozart with with the romantic um, period and influenced Franz Liszt and, and, you know, so on and so forth. And that's that to me is still earth shattering and heavy and amazing, you know. Um, so well, hopefully that won't be anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know I know what you mean by that, because like I. I've probably listened to Dark Side 500 times. Yeah. And, I, and every time I, and I'm really affected by that record. And my wife is from the UK and about, uh, oh, maybe 15 years ago, my son, older son was probably 13 at the time. And he likes the same kind of music. And I, I watched this documentary, The Making Of, right? And, and they talked about, you know, the lunatic is on the grass. Mm -hmm. Roger Waters wrote that because he, he, they went to school at Cambridge and there was this little patch of grass. And he said it was right, right in King's college chapel. And mm. there was a patch of grass and there was, a, he goes, I found it so stupid, this beautiful patch of grass. And there were these signs keep off, do not, you know, don't walk on the grass or keep off the grass. And we, this was so cool. We had the chance. We went exploring around England one time when my wife went to see her mom and we all went, we took all the kids and we went to King's College Chapel and I went out back with my son and I had the whole thing set up. I had a, um, it wasn't like a Walkman and it wasn't an iPod. I don't know what it, it was like a CD player, I guess, but I had two headphones and one set for him. And we sat and listened to that whole, you know, thing, just sitting there on the same bench that Waters wrote the song. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. So, so I really know how you feel because it's, it's when something has affected you that greatly, it's affected you that, you know, it's just really profound yeah. and it means so much to you. I totally get that, man. I got to record at Abbey Road when I did the movie um, In Dreams that the, that Elliot Goldenthal scored and, and to stand in the Beatles room B and to, 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 to go up and hug the wall and to look up into that control room that George Martin sat in up to that steep staircase and walk through the doors where they would go to the cafeteria and smoke and take coffee breaks and whatever. And they shot the all you need is love video in there with the stones and everybody that room packed full of people. And it's, you know, that's, I mean, I'm, I, obviously pop music and rock music has had as, as a large impact as jazz. As I mean, just for me, there's something about jazz 
and classical music that's so personal because it's not so universally um, uh, uh, n- n- common and, and known as the Beatles. Everyone knows the Beatles and everyone loves the Beatles, but I feel like I get Charlie Parker to myself almost in a weird way. And I like, I feel like there should be Charlie Parker Boulevard in every town at the same <laughs> time. I don't care if somebody tells me I don't like jazz. I did many, many years ago. I think it was details magazine asked me to do 10 jazz albums for jazz haters. And I said, I absolutely will not do that. I will do, <laughs> I will do 10 Van Gogh paintings for Van Gogh, go haters. How about that? And they're like, what? I'm like, I don't give a shit if somebody doesn't like jazz. It's your loss, you know? And so, uh, you, uh, you want to keep it all to yourself. That was funny. Yeah, but I just, I mean, at the you know, same, same time, it's like, it's your loss. You know, it's like my uh, my ex- oh, former drummer said, I don't like Jimi Hendrix. And I gave him access to Boulder's Love. And he goes, this is a lot better than I thought. I'm like, this, this, this music is influencing the music you're playing. You know, the unsung break, you know, uh, if you think of song, like if Six Was Nine or... But uh, do uh, 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 fire, you know, those drum breaks. Like, well, that's the thing I had in mind that and it's like it's not Jimi Hendrix's fault. It's your shortcoming. If you don't appreciate <laughs> music, this is like the oxygen. This is the sky is blue. Oh, I don't like the sky being blue. Well, tough shit. You know, what I mean, this is these things. There's a, at a certain point, you know, you don't it doesn't matter what anyone's opinion about something is. It's just great. Dark side of the moon. It does. I don't give a shit if somebody doesn't like the record. It's your loss. Yeah. That is a, that's a masterpiece that has changed the world, mm. changed popular culture, uh, music, fashion, everything. This album had a, such a massive impact, you know, um, uh, you know, as did Sergeant Pepper's or, uh, um, you know, a love Supreme by John Coltrane, whether people know it or not, Charlie Parker's music, inventing bebop, all these, it uh, affects people. And they don't even know it. I mean, I've, it's, uh, it's funny that people have said, you know, said to me that, you know, rattle off the bands that, that helmet in, influenced and have had guys tell me from the Deftones to system of a down, you know, we absolutely are corn. We absolutely were listening to you guys and did, we're trying to do this thing or whatever. And it's, I met some guys, I can't even remember their name. It's embarrassing at the at a festival and they pulled me aside and they were one of the big bands at the uh, Wacken festival in Germany. And they were like, we absolutely, you know, helmet was changed, ch- you know, changed our, our, our lives. And it, 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 it means we did something right and we're doing something right. It's about the music. And I said, uh, talked about tapping in, to or or having an appreciation for music history and art history and literature and all these things that we're part of we're part of that you know the creative process whether it's you know reading a great book or standing as i say where van gogh stood or um and it's and it's to me it's 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 incredible there's an energy there is like a, a, a string there's some kind of energy that is will be passed on for you know 10 5 to 15 20 300 years now Be- uh, bach has been dead since 1750 he still moves me i listen to his you know the uh, brandenburg concertos two days ago you know and it's still like well, how did he come up with this you know and it's still progressive it's still these incredible the clashes and tensions and you know, and uh, this, you know, that the, the, these passing notes have where like there would be this this dense dense moment just for a split second where this is dissonant jazz chord, you know, and it's that still fascinates me. But uh, has your life been different than what you'd imagined? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I necessarily ever had a plan though. Uh, when I look back to that laying in the middle of Hayward Field at University of Oregon and. Um, I was, you know, looking in the clouds and, and the stars and kind of picturing what I was going to do with my life. It just involved uh, uh, doing something that I loved and was passionate about every day, music. And I felt like it, I would never run out of things to to study and pursue and see and seek in music. And I was right. And I have been right. And if I die tomorrow, uh, you know, I feel like I've I've made progress every day as a musician you know and and as and your life path kind of you know mirrors your musical path in a lot of ways and i think what music has provided for me um i didn't think about oh I, if i'm in a band and i get to, to to see the world you know and i have gotten i've been gotten to go to amsterdam 20 times or you know i'm familiar with certain things i have old favorite places to go in Prague, for example. And that's that kind of thing I didn't, I never expected. So I never had a big master plan, just 
you know, pursue what I love. And I've been really, I feel really fortunate that, you know, I've been able to, to kind of eke out a living at it and make ends meet. Awesome. Favorite New York city food, man. Pizza. Yeah, man. You gotta, gotta love that. I, every, every time I, every time I get off the road, uh, would get off the road, I would do two things. Uh, <laughs> Get a, I get a, usually go to Mo, uh, Mogador, which thank God is still there on Where St. Mark. Okay. I don't know uh, that one. Parks between first Avenue and Avenue a it's, um, and you should go. It's I'm gonna still check it out. to this day, still inexpensive and amazing. Get, get the Moroccan eggs with a side of hummus that my uh, late uh, uh, friend, Tim Carr, uh, turned me on to. He lived next door to Mogador and he uh, was an A&R guy at Warner brothers that tried to sign helmet and, uh, uh, he, um, uh, the Led Zeppelin physical graffiti building is across the street. So you can also take a picture of that. Um, but that, and then I would always get a slice at some point that first, first day back. And last question, man, uh, what's been the biggest change in your personality page over the last 10 years and how much of the change has been intentional and how much is just a factor of aging? I think uh, like to have tried to tried to calm myself, not lose the energy and enthusiasm I have for things, but try to focus. I've tried meditation. Sometimes I'm good. Sometimes I'm bad. Um, I think, you know, per, you know, with personality changes, I don't think you can change your personality. I think you're, you, you are who you are, but you can, but you, if you fall down today, you have to get up the next day or the same day. And I think, that's something that if you've had a bad day, a bad week, a, a bad few days that you have, we have the opportunity to wake up every single day and start over, start from scratch. And that's something that I, I, I can't stress enough. And, and if I, when I work with kids and do these clinics, it's like, there's your, there's, there's, there's no right answer. Just have kind of a system for yourself. And so for me, that's, you know, that's a musical kind of being organized in my, you know, my, my, my work process. Um, it varies whether I'm home or traveling or, you know, on the road, it's, it's, it's different, but I think you have to constantly work on yourself. I'm going to screw up tomorrow and then the next day I'll have to get up again and do better. So. Absolutely, man. I can't thank you enough. I want to give a shout out to Chris trainer for uh, hooking us up. And also I want to tell people where you can find you. First of all, uh, if you've never listened to helmet, you got to listen to the band. They're a wonderful band. Uh, it's Paige Hamilton and, uh, the new album, the last album is called dead to the world. That's as good a place as any to start with helmet, man, to be honest with you. Ooh, I mean, yeah. I think that's a great place actually. Um, and you can check it out on Spotify, Apple, Pandora, and you can buy it anywhere. The, the usual place is Amazon. Um, man, Talk about, you got a few things going on. There's a CBGB show from 1990 that's coming out soon. Yeah, we're going to, I will haven't mixed it yet, but that's the goal is to get it out in the next six, six months. And we also have the, um, the, the four remaining cover songs that we haven't released with that artwork that we did, that I did with the scene four guys in Los Angeles, um, which was pretty ingenious. They, they, they designed a, they've been working with drummers, but they designed a glove with, primary colored lights on the four fingers and we sat in a pitch black room and took photos uh, while i was playing it was just a giant bone that the dog dropped on the <laughs> the dogs are lounging around in entertainment here um but yeah so we're gonna release those i think the bowie cover of move on uh will be the first one and then we have a blue oyster cult cover of eti a wire cover for mercy and then another we did another beatles another Beatles song. Um, and I'm only sleeping. So very cool. I like that blue Oyster cold song. I remember listening to that, uh, all the time. And, yeah. um, and Hey, when you release those, you let me know, we'll post them up and then talk about cool. your, I mean, like you, there's so much shit we didn't get to talk about that you're involved with, but you're like an artist. So talk about not like you're an artist. Talk about page Hamilton art.com what you got. going. Well, on it's, it's, it's a collaboration. I have like a, a, it was more like an artistic vision and can, I mean, it's conceptual from my standpoint. We did a piece called close the home. That was, do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you he's flapping his tail on the, and just looking at me like he's just a goofball, complete goofball. Um, uh, uh, so I, they, we, they originally met with me through, uh, Chris trainer's cousin, Trevor and said, Hey, we would love to, to work with you. And they had an idea. And I saw, I said, that's an interesting idea, but what I would like to do is kind of do a, uh, autobiographical collage. So the motel that we lived in, at, at, in, in Medford, Oregon, when my, we first moved there in 1963, uh, we have a shot of the hotel photo. And then there's an also wow. a picture of my mother. 
my mother holding me as a baby in front of this giant gas tank. And I thought it was a very interesting spot for the first pictures of your son. It's this big gas tank outside a motel. And so we went through from these, all these cool photographs from the uh, uh, 60s and 70s and pick some and kind of put this collage together. And then I do my handprints on them and I write lyrics and paint for whatever uh, the, the person that buys the, the painting wants. So that was, they put, put it together with me kind of breathing down their neck and looking over their shoulder. Uh, Ravi Dosage is the artist and uh, Corey Danziger is uh, their, their partners. And, uh, and then the next piece they came up with is Glove the the lights and we uh, it's essentially just tracing my my guitar playing and it's really beautiful and so you can see whatever you want in the paintings i'm i the ones that we sold i titled after like one's called fandango because it looks like a woman dancing and after the zz top um album one's called uh, uh flaming telepaths after the blue oyster cult song one's called interstellar space after the john coltrane album one's called uh, black dog after the led zeppelin song et cetera, et cetera. i named them after song titles or album titles of you know musical influences of, of mine and because you would you see things and so we you we can heighten uh, the, the the colors or do different things and manipulate them with with ravi who's the artist and uh so as i say it's a collaboration my my role is more conceptual i was the performer artists so it's uh, it's a lot of fun it's interesting we'll, we might do another project together but the album the seven inch covers will be uh, for those pieces and they can find all that on page hamiltonart.com yeah page hamiltonart.com but the music i think the seven inches will release um through the helmet music uh website which is i think still being re re uh, furbished we had to uh, redo it and then uh page hamilton music is the other websites so that i haven't updated that in, in ages because i've been busy and um yes and so we're, we're going to get to that too so man i'm feeling a betty art piece that would be uh i'm feeling yeah that'd be- <laughs> hey man i can't thank you enough for everything i really appreciate it. it's been an honor and a privilege man i've really enjoyed your music for years and i'm really glad uh you, we spent some time together and thank you for being so kind and generous and open man thank you very much my pleasure man it was great great Hang on, we'll wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it with a friend on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Paige Hamilton for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. Check out all his stuff online at helmet.com, pagehamiltonmusic.com, pagehamiltonart.com. If you don't know Helmet, or even if you do know him, go dig on the new album, Dead to the World. It's really freaking cool, and it's a great place to start. And uh, he's got some covers coming out soon and we'll be talking about them on on our channels on facebook make sure you go to the home page of everyone loves guitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list to get some advanced notice of guests and you can ask them questions and most important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have fun till next time peace and love everybody i'm out We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. (music) 